Good morning, Honorable Castillo. You are sitting a little bit to the side of the screen. Is it possible to get you to the center of the screen? Uh, I'm not sure if you are supposed to shift to the left or right. Yeah, that's that's much better in that position. But if you can come close a little bit, you are, you've moved far from your camera a little bit now. Uh, we might need a little bit of light in your room because you are a little bit dark. Uh, I think the most of the light is behind you. It's best that the light is ahead of you. And you have all the walls in the room uh, be just behind you. Maybe I should uh, start off with doing the roll call now to see if all our countries are represented. Is Angola in the house? Is Angola represented? Represented? I think I saw Angola initially when we were about before we started. Botswana. Is Botswana represented? The DRC? Anyone from the DRC? Lesotho? Yes. Okay, more meeting, Eugenia, Is Lesotho represented? Madagascar? That's very bad. Oui, je suis là. Madagascar. Madagascar. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Madagascar. Uh, Malawi? Mauritius? Mozambique, our host uh, Namibia, Namibia is here, thank you very much sir, uh, Seychelles, Seychelles is here, thank you very much Seychelles, uh, South Africa. Eswatini. Tanzania. Zambia. Zimbabwe. Yes, Zimbabwe is represented. I'm here present. Thank you very much. We don't seem to have uh, a lot of um, countries represented. I'm hoping that they will be joining us in the next few minutes. Um, maybe we can give them those few minutes. Uh, Honorable members, uh, Distinguished guests and colleagues, the session is going to be broadcast live on various social media platforms. Uh, we kindly request uh, on our members to bear that in mind as they participate in the session. Um, the hashtags that we are using on the various social media platforms uh, for the session today, the first one is hashtag SADC model law on PFM. And then I'm not sure if you can see them on my screen on the side. Uh, those are the ones that you can use if you want to tweet uh, about the session. Take a picture of yourself and tweet about it or send it on uh, Facebook, on various social media, and use those uh, hashtags to inform people about your participation in the session today. Uh, we need to inform as many people as possible about the this very important uh, uh, session that we are participating in. That is... Uh, 
consultation on the uh, draft uh, SADC model law on public financial management. Dr. Moyo, are you still here? Hello. Okay, I can see you. Thank you very Hello. much. Hello, I'm here. You are, you are there, okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just want to quickly check if we are... Madam SG, maybe I should be guided. I see we've got about 38 people on the platform. And when I was doing the roll call, it seemed like uh, many countries have not uh, joined us yet. Do we continue or give them uh, two more minutes? I stand guided by you. When we kindly proceed, it is unfair for other countries. And in view of the time frames, in view of the time zones that we operate under, we may wish to proceed and at the same time um, encourage or check into those countries to see those still join us. Thank you very much, Madam SG, for that guidance. While colleagues are checking uh, and ensuring that other countries are joining us, mm -hmm. I would like to now hand over to our facilitator for today, who is Honorable uh, Dr. Gordon Moyo, who is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at the uh, Lupane State University in Zimbabwe. Uh, Dr. Moyo is a former cabinet minister and member of parliament in Zimbabwe. He also serves as the director of the Public uh, Policy and Research Institute of Zimbabwe. Dr. Moyo, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Matisse. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, um, honorable members uh, here present. We appreciate uh, uh, that you have taken your time to, to join us um, in this very important meeting. Can you tell me, am I audible enough, uh, Modisse? We might. He need you to raise your voice a bit. Uh, you are audible, but uh, just a little bit low. Okay. Right. That's better now. Yes, yes, you are a little bit better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I was saying welcome, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members uh, who are here, and we appreciate that you have taken your time to join us in this very important exercise of thinking through um, and tapping from your experience, tapping from your brains, tapping from your, your knowledge uh, as we build this uh, model, law on uh, public financial management. Um, and I am very happy that we, we are starting, and I'm, I'm very happy that you are, you are here. Uh, even if others are not yet there, they will, they will join us as uh, the SG has said. Now to kickstart our meeting, um, I will uh, invite our very own the Secretary General, Honorable Boema uh, Sekoma to welcome us. Um, uh, Madam SG, please. Good morning. Don't you Bon dia. Allow me to recognize, um, there's an echo. Allow me to recognize and respect the protocol uh, that uh, is being established this morning. Our keynote speaker, Honorable Brian Dube, uh, a member of parliament and the deputy secretary general of SADC organizations of public accounts committees, SADCOPEC, and the public accounts committee chairperson in the Republic of Zimbabwe Parliament. Allow me to recognize you, our distinguished member of, members of parliament, serving in committees responsible for public accounts, finance, budget, anti-corruption and good governance, of the SADC member parliaments. I'd also like to recognize our distinguished legal drafter, Mr. Daniel Greenback, 
who is working with us tirelessly on this drafting process of the public financial management model law. I'd also like to recognize and thank our meeting facilitator, Honorable Dr. Gordon Moyo, whose credentials have been shared with you earlier. Allow me to also thank and recognize the members of the technical working group who work with us tirelessly for us to achieve our goals. Representatives of the media organizations present today, staff of the SADC Parliamentary Forum and member parliaments, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It's with sheer pleasure and immense deference that I welcome chairpersons and honorable members of the various standing committees represented here today from our SADC national parliaments to this consultative session, which is held prior to the adoption of the public financial model law. <clears throat> Whilst I know that several of you have tight and busy schedules in your respective countries, I wish to express gratitude for your time and dedication to this consultation, which is of paramount importance to the SADC Parliamentary Forum and to the SADC region at large. Honorable members, first of all, I'd like to welcome you warmly to this event, which is organized under the auspices of the SADC Parliamentary Forum. Some of you already serve as representatives at the SADC Parliamentary Forum at the regional level and you sit in various standing committees and organs of the SADC Parliamentary Forum. For those who are interacting with the SADC Parliamentary Forum for the first time, you are welcome. And please know that the SADC Parliamentary Forum is also your home and is an extension of a national parliament at the regional level, hopefully a SADC Parliament in the near future. On our members, I applaud your commitment to public financial management. And I wish that we may soon meet in other initiatives which involve the forum in collaboration with your national parliaments. A consolidated schedule has been shared where various capacity building initiatives will be rolled out between now and December 2022, I encourage you to take interest and participate in these initiatives. Honorable members, as you may be aware, the forum is conducting a series of consultative sessions on this SADC model law on public financial management. And key stakeholders naturally include parliamentary committees, dealing with public financial management. I wish to highlight that whilst a number of stakeholders, such as auditors general, technical staff from line ministries and accounts general have been engaged, this session is the main session, which is of a parliamentary nature and takes on board views from members of parliament occupying committee positions responsible for public financial management. On our members, the standing committees involved today are those which are, in our view, deemed to be directly linked to public financial management processes in one way or the other. The audience today <clears throat> thus includes chairpersons of public accounts committees, which we believe oversee state expenditure as well as budget committees and committees pertaining to governance matters. The functions of these standing committees relate to oversight of public financial management processes in view of holding government to account on the carriage of public financial management proceedings and their existence are thus sacrosanct to checks and balances prevailing in any healthy democracy. Honorable members, 
the engagement of standing committees of parliament is all the more significant since this model law is couched from the angle of parliamentary oversight on public financial management. In other words, from the perspective of the different oversight mechanisms which parliaments hold over public financial management processes of the state. The tabling of the budget, the adoption of the budget related legislation, the consideration of the report of the Auditor General, or the examin examination of governance reports are all matters that are traditionally addressed by your standing committees at parliament across the SADC region prior to reporting same to parliament sitting in plenary. Honorable members, the SADC model law on public financial management thus aims to heighten this aspect of parliamentary oversight. It has adequate powers to firstly uncover discrepancies and irregularities in public financial management systems as reported. And secondly, take corrective action which can be acted upon and enforced. Honorable members, in addition, your standing committees of parliament are constituted of members of parliament who hold representative budgetary and le legislative functions as well. This consultative session thus also functions as a sensitization campaign for members of parliament to be acquainted to international best practices concerning public financial management, which are imbibed in the provisions of the SADC model law before you. Indeed, honorable members, with COVID-19 and other perilous phenomena which afflicted the global financial system in the last decade, there are norms and best practices on prudential planning which have emerged concerning public financial management, many of which have found their way into this draft model law. For instance, it is generally accepted worldwide that public accounts committee should exercise robust oversight over the appropriation and expenditure process and that the debt ceiling should not exceed 50 to 60% of GDP. Altogether, honorable members, you will kindly find that whilst the model law refers to parliamentary oversight in different provisions, Part five and part six refers to parliamentary control over public financial management processes in particular. You are thus kindly requested to pay special attention to those parts as you engage on the provisions of the model law today. Honorable members, colleagues and distinguished participants, our expectations from you today are very straightforward. We look forward to your open, frank discussions, which the legal drafter often gracefully takes on board and incorporates them or considers them for incorporation at a later stage. I wish to reiterate that the model law has been pitched from the angle of parliamentary oversight. And thus the model law before you generally focuses on the relationship between parliament and parties administering the public financial management system. Your views will thus be awaited on the adequacy of the provisions in view of reinforcing the oversight functions of parliament in this regard. You are therefore encouraged to submit written submissions from your committees for consideration by the legal drafter. On our members, you'll know that for instance, the powers of the Public Accounts Committee under Section 46 include to make inquiries and refer irregularities found to law enforcement authorities, including anti-corruption agencies. This honorable members is to ensure that the reports of the committee are not tabled and then confined to the drawers. 
but that there is a consistent follow-up on the matter. In addition, the Public Accounts Committee will also supervise a complaints portal regarding public financial management and will have an opportunity to report to Parliament regarding the same. On our members, I believe you'll concur that these are entirely new proposals which deserve to be considered by yourselves in view of validating this model law at a later stage. Honourable members, I wish to state at this point that coming forward with a model law on public financial management is a very ambitious feat, yet quintessential to the SADC region. There is no similar model law on public financial management which has been developed across the globe. So far, and, and members of parliaments today are thus pioneering and creating history. In this regard, participants today will realize that this model law will not only serve to guide the SADC region, but the whole world. This model law, we are con confident, constitutes the building blocks for a better world where robust public financial management systems prevail. While there will always be room for improvement, and I underlined the basic ingredients for good governance and sound public financial management are contained within the provisions of this draft model law. On our members, having said what I have said so far, there's no doubt that standing committees of parliament will play a central role in the domestication of the model law once it has been adopted by the SADC Parliamentary Forum policy making organ referred to as the Plenary Assembly. Members of Parliament will be at the center stage of the domestication process by pushing for same with line ministries and other departments through parliamentary questions and other interventions. In addition, it is expected that members of parliament will liaise with the dedicated organ of the forum, the Regional Parliamentary Model Law Oversight Committee, which is made out of chairpersons of all standing committees of the regional committees of the SADC Parliamentary Forum to furnish reports and shadow reports on domestication progress and challenges encountered in that respect. I therefore encourage you to approach our chairpersons and do exactly that for the progress of our region. We also envisage to develop scorecards on the model law, and it is expected that same will be filled at national level by a multi-stakeholder national working group consisting of members of parliament, together with line ministries and departments. Your input today thus constitute the beginning of a long, and consistent engagement on the public financial model law. Honorable members, colleagues, and distinguished participants, I wish to end these remarks by expressing gratitude for your keen participation. In the 21st century, public funding is central to human and social development. Since this funding devolves on the running of public hospitals, of schools or public infrastructure, all of which are essential to life itself. Without public funding, honorable members, the doors of schooling will be closed for some, and some household will run out of potable water and many others. Therefore, there is no nation on earth which can survive without the yearly government budget, which injects funds into the economy. Honorable members, does this public financial management normative standards are paramount to act as checks on public funding. And it is that a central tenant of the democratic framework of the SADC region. Honorable members, even if the road ahead is a long and bumpy one, the SADC model loan PFM is acting as a driver for change in the right direction and compounded 
with a parliamentary impetus, it will surely carry us to the right destination. On this note, I wish to welcome you and wish you all a fruitful session. I thank you for your listening. Thank you, Madam SG, um, for your submission. It was very comprehensive and we are honored to have you as the SG of our regional parliament. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for now, allow me, Madam uh, SG, to invite our guest of honor, um, who is the Deputy Secretary General of SADC Organization of Public Accounts Committees. He is also an honorable member of parliament for Gweru Eben constituents in Zimbabwe, and is the current chairperson of public accounts committee in the parliament of Zimbabwe. And above that, he is an, uh, an award-winning human rights lawyer, my friend, Honorable Brian Dube. The platform is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, facilitator, and thank you very much, SG. I hope I am audible. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, greetings to you all, friends and colleagues. Uh, myself and on behalf of Sadkopak, we want to express our gratitude to Sadak PF for this opportunity given to us to present a message of support or keynote address to this important meeting. Sadkopak believes that the Sadak PF and Sadkopak share a similar vision and mission in as far as the monetary issues in SADAC are concerned. SADCOPAC aims to strengthen good governance, promoting transparency through mutual support, knowledge and experience sharing among PAC committees from the region as a means of enhancing oversight. SADCOPAC is a voluntary organization which was established in 2003 and is composed of public accounts or similar committees representing 13 SADC parliaments. SADCOPAC is pleased to note that this event comes at a crucial time in the history of our two organizations, whereby on the 21st of February 2022, SADCOPAC office bearers and SADAC PF leadership will meet in Windhoek Namibia to sign a memorandum of understanding between SADCOPAC and SADAC PF. The MOU serves to recognize the importance and of complementarity of the mandates of the two institutions and thus seeking to strengthen the cooperation for the mutual interest and common benefit of SADAC parliaments and the SADC region at large. SADAC PF ag agrees to cooperate and collaborate with SADCOPAC on matters of mutual interest and in an endeavor to foster the objectives of SADAC aimed at promoting regional integration and to achieve development and economic growth in SADAC member states. The parties agreed to closely collaborate with each other in order to achieve their common objectives. SADCOPAC and SADAC PF will support each other in the following areas, joint research and knowledge production, dialogue and consensus building, capacity enhancement, annual joint working and review sessions and bilateral consultations. Based on the facts highlighted above, SADCOPAC is in full support of the development of a SADAC model law on public finance management. In parliamentary democracies, PACs or similar committees assume a position of great importance. Administrative accountability to the legislature has become the sine qua non of 
such parliamentary systems. However, the phenomenon of municipality multiplicity of governmental activities has made the task of legislatures extremely complex as well as diversified. By its very nature, parliament cannot exercise effective control over activities of the executive without using such standing committees. Administrative accountability to the legislature through committees has been the hallmark of democratic systems. In most countries, PAC enjoy a high profile in the committee systems. A SADCO PAC, we are therefore pleased to partner with SADAC PF and we look forward to a fruitful partnership. It is SADCO PAC swap that the model law will also then be domesticated by the respective member states and that there will be actually uniformity in the functions and exercise of the respective committees in the fight against corruption, in the fight against abuse of national resources, in the fight uh, against non-disclosure or in failure to have transparency in the way business is done. And above all, our wish as SADCO PAC is that all the national resources in SADAC must be used to the mutual benefit of the nation and also for the growth of the economies as well as eradication of extreme poverty, which is a serious challenge that the region is currently facing. And it is my hope and prayer that the model law will actually be a good sign of the commitment by irrespective governments to make sure that the resources are properly taken care of and parliaments are empowered to do much more in terms of fighting the abuse of resources in our respective countries. Allow me to wish all of us a constructive deliberation throughout the session. Thank you, SG, and all honorable members and colleagues here present. Thank you very much, um, uh, Honorable Duve. Um, I was very excited to hear you say that the SADCO Park is fully committed to the model law uh, that we are working on. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, because we are speaking of uh, Secretary General, that, that's very important for this process. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much. We have done the initial uh, phase of our, of our program. We have been welcomed by the Honorable SG and we have heard um, the keynote address from our guest of honor. And now we move on to tape from your brains. But before you, we do that, allow me to, to refresh in your minds and say, uh, this meeting is meeting number three. This consultative uh, meeting is meeting number three. Uh, last week, um, uh, we had a meeting with the Auditors General. And we consulted them. We had an exciting, exciting engagement. Um, and two days ago, uh, we had a meeting with the uh, uh, Ministries of Finance, uh, Economic Development Planning, uh, we had an exciting meeting, exciting engagement, and we tapped from their brains. And today, we have you, and you are a very important stakeholder because you are in the heart of it. You are coming from Parliament, and this is Parliament. Sadiq is, is Parliament, and you are coming from Parliament. So you are very important. You, uh, but before we 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 go into the the main subject. Uh, we would like to show you a very short video clip uh, drawn from Uganda. Uh, I know Uganda is not part of SADIC, so some of you might say, but why Uganda? It's important that we learn from other regions. What happens in other regions, whether within Africa or outside the times, um, it can have some uh, bearings to, to us. So we want to draw some lessons uh, from 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 Uganda. So let's have a very short video. Uh, watch it and uh, create images in your mind, questions and uh, comments, and prepare yourself for deeper engagement. 
Uh, ICT, please. ICT. Apologies, we're just loading it up. Okay. My name is Samson Kasumban. This is the focal point. Let me begin with definitions, and I'll read the definition exactly the way it is. Corruption is the diversion of public resources for private, that is personal or none other than public use, and that's when one wants to gain or abuse a public authority or position for private gain and a weak public financial management system, leaving the poor open for corruption. Let's talk about corruption. And my guest uh, uh, this evening is Mr. Julius Kapepe, the Director of Programs at the Uganda Dead Network. You're very welcome, Julius. Uh, thank you. Yes, my pleasure to, to be here once more. Since we met, do you think we are walking further on the right road to ending corruption, or are we stagnant? I think generally the, the road is... Uh, we are moving forward towards curbing corru corruption, but the road is so rugged that we are stagnating somewhere, even though we seem to see light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. There have been f significant steps made by government, the establishment of the anti-corruption unit, the president talking about corruption and the fight against corruption. He told us this was Chisanja Hakuna Muchezo, but yet we continue to see loans, taxes and grants being um, used. Do you think they're used in a prudent manner? Now that we're even talking about building roads in Congo, one would say, what about the ones we still have to build here? Yeah, I, I think uh, generally as you observe the his Excellency President Museven has been categorical against corruption. In fact, he has committed himself previously in 2006 in onwards to date to zero tolerance to corruption. Beyond the words and, and big speeches, we, we seem to see an extent uh, of, of, of positive move. But in some other areas, we see certain loopholes that remain glaring. It is evident that as a country, we've, uh, if you looked at the case of, uh, say, petty corruption or small corruption, I could say small corruption, kin to kidogo that a police officer has stopped you at uh, the roadside and you have parted with the 5,000 shillings is bad and bad enough, but is not as damaging as the, for instance, grand corruption, where we seem to see syndicated way of steering. If you looked at some of these projects, there are for the loans and other public resources generally that have been used. We see those kinds of instances. So even the, the Sanja Hakuna Muchezo 
to some extent in terms of institutional establishment could have achieved, but we have also seen where billions have continued to disappear. So are you basically saying that as a government, we should be in the fight against corruption, we should be looking at return on investment. Don't invest 100 million in punishing somebody who stole 10 million. That, that in itself is that corruption. We took public sector reforms to weed out the bad apples, to remove the corrupt, and to generally do clean up. That nonetheless continued creeping through, and even in 2000 to where we are, we seem to be ready for another set of reforms. So that means that, for instance, in terms of institutions, there are those institutions, if you want to deliver a service to Ugandans, that you do not need. And that's where we are coming from, that you do not have to invest billions for you to be able to deliver or even get back millions. Let me ask, do you think, because the, the supplementary budgets mm. are, are on the increase, they are now in the trillions, would you consider that in a subtle way as syndicated corruption? Because how come we budget and all the time we have some supplementary budgets and they seem to be now going to the trillions? Continued supplementary expenditures definitely undermine the credibility of the budget every financial year. That in Uganda, alas, has continued to be a creeping culture and it is not the way to go. Is it, it corruption? It, the, the constitution of Uganda uh, of 1995 as amended as well as the Public Finance and Accountability Act, Man Public Finance Management Act, is very categorical on, you, on how do you handle uh, supplementaries. And it gives three conditions, an absorbable, unforeseen, and an unavoidable circumstances. Outside any of those three, then it is a degree of corruption. In fact, if we took a sample of just this financial year, where we have seen about six supplementary budgets, budgets coming in day, evening, and night, it is a form of corruption. Why? We need to look at the specifics. Do you have some examples? Let's take uh, just, just the, the, the COVID uh, kind of related supplementaries. Nobody could have seen COVID. It, precisely. But you expected to deliver so much of masks across a spectrum of Ugandans. Have you received one? Yourself? Never done. 82 billion. Precisely. That's what we are talking about. So what if you, you, if what you, you, if you are have against, a, If you have a parliament you are, that you, approves a supplementary budget but goes and hides its own share, not through the main discussion on the parliamentary floor, but through a parliamentary commission. And in fact, even when you add up those billions of money, you still have certain sums of money, about 200 billion or so, that is lingering and it is not clear on where exactly it is. Then it, 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 it is construed as corruption. Do you think we see that this is wrong? Or are we at the point where those of us raising issues about it are the ones seen as having a problem? I have an impression that, for instance, if you, look, if you looked across the spectrum of public servants, not everyone is a rotten tomato. There are those diligent ladies and gentlemen we know about that not only have earned accolades, but actually can be seen in, in the way they do their work and deliver results for this country. So some, yes, but not all of them across the spectrum. Let's get to how we get those who govern us through our electoral processes. Um, some have argued that if the means is questionable, it can't bring an end that is unquestionable. How we raise money to finance electoral campaigns. Do you think there is an issue there? Some have large sums, some don't. In fact, some presidential candidates have already suspended campaigns over matters of inavailability of, pub of campaign finance. Precisely, researches have been done, and even logically, it is known that if you have a questionable start process, it will give you an, a, a, a questionable end result. 
So to the extent that, for instance, we are not very, very clear, we do not have uh, a, a seal on how much money should be involved in the electoral process. Student, oh, one for campaign fundraise locally and internationally. That is not a problem. We need to be clear on how much should be the extent of money during the electoral process. What should be the sources of prudent money for electoral process and any other process. So the Financial Intelligence Authority therefore comes in terrible. District um, budgets being used uh, to finance campaigns. I mean, if I'm in, I'm, I am an incumbent, I am intending to run towards the elections, I use the district finances to grade roads and do all these sorts of things to show what I'm doing. Is that also in your opinion, corruption? And is there a way even of dealing with it or should we be relying on one's morality? That would constitute corruption definitely if you have public resources being diverted at whatever level, including at the district. In fact, the bigger challenge is not at the district levels, but at the central government. Rem recalling that trillions of shillings that out of a given budget, for instance, for this financial year, the previous financial year, for a budget of ab about 45 trillion or 42 as in the previous financial years, it is just about three trillion that makes it to the local governments. Of course, part of which is used for service delivery, and maybe part of that is what is involved through corrupt means. So it means that the central government, which retains a huge chunk of the fiscal resources, is where we should even be putting a bigger eye. And, and the Auditor General has been very, very categorical on where some of these monies have been stored from, stolen from ministries, departments, and agencies of, local, of government. And therefore, to that extent, it is possible that it is those monies that make their way into uh, the electoral process. And we think that the law going forward needs to come and be stronger and curb some of these tendencies that are creeping. Into. Do you think that as a nation, we understand that corruption, especially petty corruption, mm -hmm is as bad and dangerous mm -hmm. as syndicated or we now have corruption and corruption in about 40 seconds <laughs> we we have of course uh, petty corruption we also have bureaucratic corruption which is which is like the, the, the working with the systems that can frustrate but we also have the grand or the political corruption of those three categories the political corruption is where you seem to see syndicated type of affair and we think that the syndicated one, the political or the grand corruption, is the most dangerous of the three. Okay. Yeah. Julius Kapwepwe from Ugandan Debt Network, thank you so much for talking to us. Indeed, having been speaking about corruption, I don't want to be corrupt with time. Until next time, this has been The Focal Point. Uh, like like the presenter there, I don't want to be corrupt with time. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for, for watching and listening. We, we don't have to discuss anything on this one. We just uh, needed you to, to, to have a look and relate <coughs> uh, those uh, interviews uh, with whatever happens in your own country and in the region. For now, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, allow me to invite our um, our legal mind our legal drafter of the draft model law uh, the process would be um, you will make a presentation uh, but during the presentation if you have something that you think you need to to raise with him please raise your hand we will see your hand and you, we will engage uh, but otherwise, we will make a presentation. After a brief presentation, we will then open uh, the, the, the house and uh, we then engage. Then we can take from, from your, your input. Um, otherwise, uh, Daniel, uh, that's your time. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Greenberg. I am the 
Council for Domestic Legislation in the House of Commons in the United Kingdom Parliament. I am the general editor of Westlaw UK for Thomson Reuters. I am the author of a number of legal dictionaries and works on legislation. And I have a national and international uh, legislation drafting training and advisory practice. Uh, I join you this morning as the drafter of the model law on public financial management for the SADC parliamentary forum. And I am very grateful for the introductions of the uh, Honorable Dr. Moyo, our facilitator, who is um, a distinguished member of the technical working group and who has already, uh, as a member of that group, contributed a number of very significant changes to the model law as it lies before you this morning. I am grateful for the introduction of the Honourable Secretary General, and I am also grateful for the uh, introduction of the Honourable Brian Dubé, the keynote speaker this morning. I am grateful for the Honourable Brian Dubé's introduction of the topic and the model law to the forum today. And I am prospectively grateful to all of you for your challenges, comments, questions, and contributions on the development of the model law, which must be owned by parliamentarians as well as by citizens if it is going to achieve its uh, objective. I would like to make two uh, points by way of explaining to you all the approach that I have taken in drafting the provisions before I draw our attention to some specific provisions of the model law. At that point, I will hope to share my screen and take us through the model law, uh, adverting to specific provisions that are likely to be of particular interest to honorable delegates today. But first, I would like to share with you two fundamental problems that the drafter of a law of this kind has to deal with. First, the law has to balance a number of different conflicting concepts and desiderata. In particular, I start with simplicity and certainty. It is the aim of all of us that this model law should be sufficiently simple for it to be able to be domesticated and after domestication applied and enforced in an effective and clear way. We want to keep things simple. However, we have to balance simplicity with the demands of certainty. It doesn't help to put in something which is a mere pious hope without sufficient detail to be certain as to what the law requires. I was struck, as I'm sure honorable delegates were, during the video clip we just heard. I was struck by how easy it is to all agree that corruption is bad and how difficult it is to all agree on exactly what corruption means or exactly what we do or don't want to do about it in particular respects. So the law has to be simple, so that we all accept and understand its underpinning precepts, but it has to have enough detail to give certainty as to what it is actually meant to achieve for citizens on the road and in the workplace. Secondly, we have to balance clarity and flexibility. It would be absolutely pointless to present the model law as a snapshot of where we happen to be, a frozen snapshot of where we happen to be on public financial management principles and practice today. You, Honorable Madam Secretary General, you do not wish to present to the forum for adoption 
a law that is bound to become obsolete within days of its having been approved and implemented. So it has to be flexible, but if it's too flexible, it's not clear. And again, there's no point producing something and approving something that is so flexible, no one knows what it's meant to achieve today. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples, if I may. Crypto assets. Cryptocurrency and crypto assets in various forms present one of the biggest public financial management challenges today for countries all around the world. Central banks may decide to issue their own cryptocurrency, and some central banks are doing so. Central banks may decide not to, but one thing we can all promise ourselves, and that is a central bank that just sets its face against issuing cryptocurrency is not going to be able to avoid having an effective policy on the valuation and management of cryptocurrency because there will be cryptocurrencies entering the public financial domain in one form or another, be it only as part of a portfolio of assets of a state-owned enterprise that is on the public debt balance sheet, for example, or for one or other of a multiplicity of reasons. And yet, we cannot provide today for effective audit of crypto assets, for effective valuation of crypto assets. We don't know how cryptocurrencies and other crypto assets are going to be used in a month, let alone in 10 years' time. This is an example, therefore, of how the model law balances flexibility against clarity. When we come to part 12 of the model law later in my presentation, you will see that we are broadly adopting the regulatory principles in accordance with a decision made by our own technical working group of which the Honourable Facilitator, Dr. Gordon Moyo, is a member. And that, that draws, amongst other things, on principles established by the London School of Economics and Political Sciences Institute of Global Affairs, basic principles for regulating crypto assets, their fourth draft of the 9th of January 2019, and those principles in the fourth draft remain the principles that are applied today. Broad principles that we believe are likely to be timeless, but with powers to apply a certainty and, sim and simple but accurate uh, mechanism to enact those broad principles, to embrace changing real world developments in relation to the use and valuation of crypto currencies and other crypto assets. Third, accessibility and accuracy. Distinguished delegates today are all parliamentarians, and you are all well used to reading and understanding a technical document of this kind, both in terms of its legal content, its legislative content, and indeed its financial professional content but we are all of us writing a law in which we hope the citizenry can have confidence and trust. And as a parliamentary drafter of 35 years standing, I believe passionately in the importance of individual citizens feeling able at least to understand the basic structure of an act of parliament in a matter that is as central to their well-being as public financial management. Yes, there will be details of the act that require to be accurate, and because they are accurate, they will be beyond the comprehension of most citizens without a background in law or finance or both. But the fundamental principles of public financial management should be articulated in the model law, and we will see this, I hope, in a few moments, in a way that an individual citizen can say to herself or himself, this represents the founding principles on which my money, my money 
is raised and handled by the parliamentarians who serve me. And finally, in terms of balancing principles, we have to balance, uh, bal bal balancing uh, different tensions, we have to balance the articulation of principle against enforcement. I was struck in the video clip that we heard a few moments ago, I was struck by the reference to, should we rely on people's personal morality? And you might expect honorable delegates that as a lawyer, I would say, of course not. We never rely on people's morality. We throw the law at it. We tie people up with law. But that's very much not how I feel. I feel that a law that sets out to be prescriptive and stultifying immediately creates an avoidance, an avoidance appetite, if you like. And I believe as the as one of the conversants in the video clip said, I believe that public sector workers, by and large, do wish to embrace and embody, live up to the virtues of public responsibility. But we have to articulate those in a form in which people can understand what is expected of them. And then, we have not to be naive. We have to accept that there will be lapses and where there are lapses, people must be aware and the citizens must be aware that the mechanism exists to deal with lapses in a real, effective, efficient and timely way. And we will look at, um, we will look at part 16, which deals with uh, part 11 and part 16, dealing with financial misconduct and misuse um, and offenses under the, under the model law, we will look at that with that balance in mind. The second point I wish to make before I take us through some provisions of the model law is to echo a point made by the Honorable Brian Dubey, the, our keynote speaker today, in his distinguished address, in which he drew our attention to the complexity of the multiplicity of arrangements in different countries today, in different member states of the SADC. And we have therefore had to balance, to reflect a different balance in different jurisdictions between the constitution, other laws, and this model law. To give you an example, some of you sitting on the Public Accounts Committee are representing a constitutional committee, a statutory committee established by your constitution. Others of you are representing a committee not established by the constitution, but established by your Public Audit Act. And yet others of you are representing a purely parliamentary committee which is not adverted to in the constitution or in any other law, but which rests on the inherent jurisdiction of parliaments to establish committees to scrutinize the executive. We therefore have to allow in the model law sufficient flexibility to ensure that in domesticating this law, you will adapt it and modify it so as to avoid overlap with your constitution or other laws, and certainly to avoid any conflict between it and your other laws. And footnotes to the model law in a number of places animadvert to particular uh, potential uh, overlap and give an indication to the domestication committees in due course where they will need to uh, oversee, adapt and modify. With those introductory remarks, I will now seek to share my screen with you and show you the uh, particular aspect of the model law to which I would like to draw attention. Um, I would ask someone from the Secretariat very kindly to let me know now orally um, 
Are you able to see my screen? We are. Thank you very much. Um, so I hope honorable delegates can see that I have started you here in part two of the model law, aims and objectives. Um, as I've already said, I believe this to be fundamentally important in ensuring that your citizens feel ownership of this. But I think, if I may say so, it's equally important that you are comfortable that these provisions, that these principles represent, properly articulate the ideals and aims and objectives that you have as parliamentary committees in overseeing public financial management. Uh, I note that an uh, honorable facilitator, Dr. Gordon Moyo, will be aware of this. I note that some of these provisions have been considerably enhanced as a result of the input of the distinguished international members of the technical working group. As a result of their intervention, these are the purposes of the model law as articulated in clause nine, to foster accountability, transparency, independence and modernity through efficient and effective processes that are to flow into the raising of revenue, expenditure of revenue, accounting for revenue and parliamentary oversight. I make two points here. First, I draw the attention of distinguished honorable delegates to the fact that this is not in the preamble. This is in a clause in the model law. It is operative law. The distinguished keynote speaker, Honorable Brian Dubay, who is himself a, a, an, an, a, an extremely distinguished and esteemed legal colleague, may address us later on the court's increasing willingness to construe the provisions of an act by reference to the purpose clauses those clauses within the Act, which as operative clauses, articulate the purpose by reference to which individual provisions are to be applied, construed and interpreted. So that is the first thing that I'd like you to, to take to have in mind when you read these, the, the provisions of part two. Secondly, I would like to draw the attention of distinguished delegates in particular to the reference to expenditure because very often in terms of parliamentary procedure, we consider the raising of funds through the budget, uh, estimates based on estimates of expenditure. Um, I was very struck in the first uh, consultative forum that we carried out, um, distinguished honorable secretary general will recall that we showed a video clip um, that had a number of young citizens from different Sadduk states expressing their views. And one of them gave some very trenchant views in particular. She said, um, I, she said, I know that the government has spent a great deal of money on improving the infrastructure for road vehicles, the, the transport infrastructure for vehicular traffic. And she said, that's great. But she said, in this country, most of the roads are in the big cities and I don't live in a big city and I don't expect to go to a big city. And I would like to know that some of the money is coming my way, to put it bluntly. I would like to be able to see that there is oversight of expenditure in a way that reflects a fair balance of expenditure to benefit different classes of citizens. And we have taken care later in the budget documents to ensure that the flow of expenditure and the, di the direction of different flows of expenditure will hopefully be transparent through the budget process in a way that gives that citizen the confidence and understanding that she was rightly and clearly uh, and very articulately seeking. Leading directly from that is a clause on measurable outcomes. 
Distinguished delegates will, um, will forgive me if I say that the citizenry trust what they can measure. Sometimes the citizenry come to distrust words if they are merely words, and they like to be able to test and measure against benchmarks that you can, you can touch, so to speak. And we have therefore incorporated an aim, and again, this is a, an enforceable aim as a matter of administrative law, that in the optimization of revenue and expenditure, there should be, um, there should be a scheme that includes measurable benchmarks for testing success, targets, outputs, measurable benchmark outputs. And we have said that those should be aiming at the optimization of revenue and expenditure, the avoidance of unauthorized expenditure, sustainability, and, and this is where uh, honorable delegates today are particularly, um, in, are particularly addressed, parliamentary accountability and oversight. And of course, there is much more that the bill has to say about those matters to which we will come shortly. Then the bill articulates in clause 11, public financial management principles, transparency, accountability and participation. Something that you as parliamentary committees, I know, hold very dear. I serve a number of parliamentary committees in the United Kingdom Parliament, and both lawyers and clerks advising those committees spend a lot of time thinking, how can we maximize public participation in the parliamentary committee process? And I know, as you do, that a committee is never so gratified as when its proceedings are taken sufficiently seriously by members of the public for them to wish to participate. And that is as much true in relation to public financial management as any other parliamentary committee. Oversight principle directly relates to the committees represented here today, but it goes beyond that. It includes parliament, but it includes the National Audit Office, and it includes other bodies with regulatory functions, which may involve sectoral regulators with particular influence or control over state-owned enterprises, for example. And finally, the responsibility principle to which I have already alluded. To underpin the responsibility principle in the way that I have already described, we have here a set of public financial management values. And these are values that I would like to think you will support the inclusion of as part of every public servant's identification with her or his relationship with the Act on Public Financial Management. Integrity, independence, impartiality, equity, professionalism, accountability and responsiveness. Um, I mentioned the footnotes that advert to the need to modify and adapt by reference to the content of the constitution. I have also put in clause 13 that gives the courts no room for doubt that that is your intention. Part three details the authorities that uh, control the process of public financial management within the executive. The Minister of Finance, the Secretary, the Finance Secretary, the Ministry of Finance, with its general functions being spelt out again to get that balance right, I hope, between simplicity and certainty, accessibility and accuracy. Um, accounting officers within each Department, government departments are very much the linchpin of financial integrity within the department, and we set their role out in some detail. 
And finally, the Auditor General has more provision later that we will see when we get there. Part four deals with public funds. I'm going to go through some of these parts quite fast um, because you will all be very pleased to hear that I'm only um, invited to speak for another 17 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of these parts quite fast. You have the documents made available to you through the chat function. And of course, I will take questions, comments, instructions, and guidance on any aspect of the model law uh, at entirely at your convenience. Um, so I'm not going to spend long on the public funds, which I think is quite me mechanistic from your perspective, and I believe it to be relatively clear. Supply and appropriation is where the parliamentary functions begin to bite, so to speak, and we have a standard system of supply and appropriation through consolidated fund acts or appropriation acts, which of course jurisdictions will vary with the nomenclature that they favor in accordance with their existing um, systems. Appropriation in aid, um, one of the aspects of flexibility that was mentioned before was supplemental budget. Supplemental budgets were mentioned in the video clip as, a, as potentially undermining the budget process. But yet, of course, you can't avoid them altogether. Appropriation in aid is one of the ways where parliamentary control through approving an appropriation act that includes appropriations in aid, um, it allows you to set flexible parameters without losing overall control over the appropriation system. And I commend Clause 33 to your attention in that regard. Part 6 deals expressly with parliamentary control. And it does so in accordance with what I have articulated as the parliamentary engagement principle. And that is the principle that Parliament should use the full range of mechanisms available to it for the purpose of overseeing and controlling the public financial management process. Honorable Madam Secretary General in her remarks this morning, adverted to the range of parliamentary committees that exist and are represented here today. There is the ubiquitous Public Accounts Committee, but there is a range of other committees and other mechanisms within each parliament to which the engagement principle expressly adverts committee hearings and inquiries, including advised by external experts, but also plenary questions and debates, written and oral questions, and ministerial statements. Here, in subsection three of clause 35, Honourable delegates will, I hope, see that I have tried to be very careful to advert to the role of standing orders and not appear to usurp it. It is very important that Parliament should remain completely in control of its own process. And even as enacted in this model law form, it is in a number of places in part six and elsewhere made clear that it is standing orders of Parliament that will determine precisely how different processes are intended to run. And the model law mandates and describes, it does not prescribe the procedure of parliament. So in this case, subject, uh, expressly subject to standing orders, the model law describes the processes and functions that parliament and committees of parliament may undertake in order to carry out its oversight and audit role, establishing inquiries, requiring support, uh, re requiring reports, work plans, reports being backward looking, work plans being forward looking, requiring the Auditor General to prepare and submit record reports, working very closely with the Auditor General, requiring the disclosure of commitments compelling the attendance of witnesses, always in accordance with your standing orders, um, using technology to, uh, to detect financial irregularities. Um, there is, of course, a slight typographical error there, which I've just taken the opportunity to correct, um, detect and report financial irregularities, and 
evaluation and reports. And the parliamentary engagement principle is addressed to the minister and the auditor general, and it is also addressed to and to be controlled by the speaker of the parliament, subject to individual jurisdictional variations. Um, the auditor general will have a core statutory function, but her or his relationship with parliament is also fundamentally addressed in clause 36. Um, there is to be an independent commission. Um, those jurisdictions that have a standing public service commission may prefer to vest this function in that commission. And an independent commission in consultation with the leader of the governing party, the leader of the primary loyal opposition party and the speaker will appoint the Auditor General and um, the Auditor General will regulate the procedures and proceedings of the office. At the meeting with Auditors General last week, a number of suggestions were made about decoupling the Minister from the Auditor General, even in relation to the making of, of regulations about the mechanism. And that is something that we have taken away to work into the model law as revised. And I therefore draw it to your attention now as a detail of the model law that you should expect to change to enhance the independence of the Auditor General. Um, status, of course, is protected protected with the Auditor General being accountable to Parliament and independent of government. The Auditor General will have access to information, so parliamentary committees may choose to get information themselves uh, independently or to receive it through the Auditor General. National Audit Office will have its own, um, its own um, system and mechanisms as is understood. And the general participatory functions of the Auditor General in, in cooperation with, in partnership with Parliament, is set out in clauses 41, 42, 43, the Auditor General providing audits and reports to Parliament. We now come to the Public Accounts Committee itself. Um, 44.1, clause 44.1, is required to reflect again the different approaches that different jurisdictions may take in their own pre-existing law. But the Public Accounts Committee in essence is any committee of parliament established with terms of reference that include performing the functions set out that we will see in one moment. And again, it is fundamental that the Public Accounts Committee in accordance with standing orders and procedures of parliament should regulate its own procedures and proceedings. And the speaker is mandated by the model law to assist the Public Accounts Committee to provide an independent, effective scrutiny and oversight of government. And there are specific pointers given as to how that should be achieved, including, of course, the published register of interests and guidance for addressing actual or perceived conflicts of interest. Um, the Public Accounts Committee is responsible to the Auditor General and publishing them alongside responses to the, uh, to the um, reports. The Public Accounts Committee is also mandated in accordance with the parliamentary participation principle to maintain a complaints portal, which may be electronic, but it doesn't have to be exclusively electronic or indeed entire, entire, at all electronic, um, a portal through which members of the public can reach the PAC to make complaints or to provide information. Um, again, we are going to look again at the minister's role in making regulations here. It's a little bit challenging because if it isn't the minister, who is it? I have given you, however, a lock here for a parliamentary resolution to be the trigger point for an enacting those regulations. 
the Public Accounts Committee is given its own enforcement powers to report, to require reports, and to require oral and written evidence. And those, the people who are, who are subject to your jurisdiction in that sense, include the finance secretary, any accounting officer of a public body covered by the model law, and any public official with responsibility for aspects or instances of public financial management. And once again, it will be standing orders that control how those requirements are imposed, but they will be backed up by a criminal offence in accordance with penalties that reflect each jurisdiction's own penal practices. Finally, in part six, and I hope honourable delegates will forgive me for having spent some time on part six because of its special nexus with this morning's uh, proceedings. Finally, the PAC is mandated to make whistleblowing arrangements. I do not need to tell honourable delegates assembled this morning the importance of having a whistleblowing outlet if the parliamentary scrutiny of public bodies is to be effective. And ultimately, as we all know, the link between effective action against corruption and the protection of whistleblowers who come forward in good faith to make allegations which may or may not be substantiated, but which are made in good faith, that link is unbreakable. Part seven includes a standard national budget procedure with the standard parliamentary control with in particular um, requirements in accordance with standing orders to ensure that individual budgetary proposals can be identified and objected to, to require implementation of, recommend, implementation of recommendations and to, uh, to um, individualize components of public financial management systems. I know that honourable delegates will share the frustration that many feel when it's an all or nothing budget with no ability to go in and do micro surgery on it, so to speak, and we have attempted to address that. Viament is another way by which financial controls can be undermined, and we have tried to preserve flexibility. You have to have viament. There has to be a flexibility to via from one fund to another, but within an overarching control that means that it is not allowed to undermine the fundamental processes. The budget process, the estimates are all as you would expect. I draw your attention to some specific documentation, which we have included because we think it will be of particular benefit to parliamentary committees. Departmental objectives, a sustainability fiscal policy, a sustainable development goals statement, a statement on international commitments and projects, a statement on equality and diversity, a statement on past year and future year implications, a statement on multi-year budget projections, and finally a public debt statement. All these things things we believe are important for your effective scrutiny and also for citizen engagement. An equality and diversity statement as part of the budget process makes a very powerful statement to citizens of how equity and fair treatment is at the heart of one of the most important government functions, the raising and spending of the citizens' money. Again, for flexibility, there is provision about in-year development and delays and variations, as well as withholding of appropriated funds and unauthorized expenditure. Part eight on government debt is detailed as it has to be, um, and I will advert to any specific issues relating to it that honorable delegates asked me to come back to. For present purposes, I simply note that the debt schedule is required to be part of the public debt statement made available to parliamentary committees as part of the budget process. 
The debt ceiling and limits with continuing scrutiny, again, are designed to combine certainty with necessary flexibility. Part nine is about procurement, and I believe that delegates will not be surprised by any of its contents. Uh, public accounting principles, the only thing I want to say in relation to that, particularly addressing PAC members and other colleagues this morning, is that we are focusing on resource accounts in accordance with international best practice, because as we saw in the video clip, cash is not the best way of monitoring proper use of resources. One has to be able to look to other aspects of the use and deployment of resources, and resource accounting is therefore to be established by the model law as one of the norms, and the Auditor General will apply a resource audit approach in scrutinizing those accounts for a true and fair view, and the Ministry will be prepared required to prepare whole of government accounts for the same reason, to give you a holistic view of what is in front of you each budget year. Um, I am conscious that I have two minutes left, and I wish to ask the Honourable Facilitator, Dr Gordon Moyo, if in order to spend a couple of moments on part 11, which is of some importance, whether he will permit me to overrun my address by three or four minutes. Uh, please go ahead. That's very kind. Um, I, I talked about this before and I said, we do want to set up good principles that people identify with, but we also want to be able to control and punish financial misconduct, misuse, and maladministration where it occurs. And this is any public official. That the parliamentary committees represented today should be able to feel that public officials are accountable to parliament, but also to the law, so that parliament cannot hold the law in scrutinizing their behavior. There is an offense of public financial misconduct, there is an offence of misuse of public funds. But for evidential reasons, there is also a wide offence of maladministration. And here, a report, which could be a report of the Public Accounts Committee, or another investigation or inquiry with a parliamentary input, that report may identify a public official as having failed properly to discharge a function or otherwise behaved improperly. And that ability to identify and alert the public to misbehavior, I believe is at the heart of effective parliamentary scrutiny and an important tool for you. And it potentially leads to other enforcement action as described. Part 12, I have already spoken about. There is only one other thing I wish to say, um, and that is to draw attention to in part 16, there is a general offence of contravention, but what I want to draw to your attention here is that there is a general power to make regulations. This would be the minister and it would be subject to parliamentary control, parliamentary scrutiny under clause 132. But we do have to have the flexibility to have supplementary regulations and also supplementary guidance. I believe in the value of informal but published transparent and accountable guidance issued by the executive and scrutinized by parliament as described in subsection 3b. Honorable delegates, I apologize for having overstayed my welcome this morning by a minute or two, and I hope I have given you a sufficient overview of the provisions of the act to enable you now to give me your instructions, your challenges, your questions, and your comments. I thank you for your patience. Then mm, rundown for the quick rundown. It's, it's a 70 pages, and uh, you managed to, to cover that uh, in a very short space of time. So thank you very much. Now it's 
open to the honorable members to make their contributions, to interrogate some of the provisions, uh, to question, uh, to, to give us the input. Uh, you can show by raising your hand and I will recognize you. Um, as you are doing that, those that will need interpretation, uh, please uh, check uh, on your screen. You can uh, choose uh, the language that you want to use and language that is there is, uh, is provided here. Um, at the same time, members can uh, post their questions, their interventions, their, their contributions on the chat there or they can uh, uh, prepare even more comprehensive uh, contributions and interventions and send them to, to the office. Um, I'm sure the email will be provided there or it's already provided for you to email your, your inputs. But for now, we have um, uh, Mohammed. Uh, yes, Mohammed, the floor is yours. Mohammed is which country? I can't see. Mauritius. Hi. Mauritius. Mauritius. Yes, the platform is yours, Mauritius. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. I have two questions. Um, the first question is in relation to uh, the proposed section 48. Uh, the powers given to the Public Account Committee to um, call witnesses. I, I don't know why the decision is to limit the power to call witnesses, limited only to the finance secretary, accounting officer and public official. When for example, in section 47, you're giving a complaint portal which presumably means that we will be receiving complaints from members of the public. And in uh, what should be section 49, whistleblowing, there is protection given to people who would depose in front of that committee. So being, I can't see why we should limit the ability to call for reports, to call for uh, inqu uh, inquiries from only these three public servants and not to the larger, a larger group. For example, why can't the PAC not um, call a supplier? For example, if there's an allegation of uh, malpractice inv involving a member of the private sector. So that, that was my first question. So I'll, I'll wait for that answer and then time permitting, I'll come to the second question. Okay, go ahead, please. I'm, so, I'm very so, okay, grateful. I'm very so the grateful question, to the, to the uh, delegate uh, from Mauritius uh, for that. Yes, and finish. Sorry, uh, Greenberg. Uh, just a minute. Uh, let uh, him uh, also present his second question. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. The second question <clears throat> is uh, in relation to the proposed section 113 disqualification. A public officer who has committed the financial maladministration may be disqualified from a specified office of, or appointment by um, resolution of parliament. So um, I wanted to, first of all, the clarification when you say that uh, an officer who has committed financial maladministration, is there just an allegation or must there have been a conviction by a court of law? Uh, when you say, when you mention that the public officer has committed financial administration. And then don't you see that there may be a problem of separation of power if we don't have a conviction and the legislature, parliament, is taking sanction against a public officer? Isn't that a usurpation of the function of the judiciary? Thank you. Uh, th th thank you, Mauritius. Again, uh, Greenberg, just a moment, uh, just in case uh, Madagascar is a similar uh, case. So uh, take down those two questions. And while I, uh, we also 
uh, that uh, contribution from Madagascar, then you, you respond one. Madagascar, Mohammed, you can put your hand down. Oui, merci, monsieur. Moi, c'est pour la mise en œuvre de la loi type sur le loi des finances de la SADEC. Je pense qu'il faudra, faudrait distinguer les pays de la SADEC parce que la capacité de l'économie de chaque pays est très différente. Par exemple, il y a des pays, par exemple à Madagascar, qui a de faibles espaces budgétaires avec des économies fragiles. Euh, en plus, le Covid qui frappe la santé de la population et aussi les catastrophes, catastrophes naturelles telles que le cyclone où il y a déjà trois qui frappent Madagascar. Il y a aussi la famine dans le sud. Donc, il est nécessaire de mesurer cette, euh, cette idée et de bien distinguer les pays à, 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 dans, dans le champ de SADEC. Au point de vue relance budgétaire, je crois qu'il faudrait clarifier le règlement sur le principe de l'annualité budgétaire. Pour les investissements, il y a des projets qui se chevauchent entre deux mandats. Par exemple, la durée de l'investissement est de sept ans, celle du tenant de pouvoir est de cinq ans. Quelle pratique à suivre à ce sujet Merci bien, monsieur. Euh, Est-ce que je peux prendre la parole à mon tour J'avais demandé la parole. Euh... Thank you. I didn't. Uh, excuse me, just a minute, just a moment. I didn't hear the interpreter. Can you confirm that the interpreter was interpreting? Interpreting Madagascar. Or anybody? Who had was mother hear me? Hello? Hello, we? Oui. Uh, can you hear me? Greenberg? Merci. Um... Greenberg. Uh, J'ai Quelques questions par rapport à la partie 6, par rapport au contrôle parlementaire. Je suis euh, présidente de la commission d'évaluation des politiques publiques à l'Assemblée nationale malgache. Et la proposition de loi que nous avons propose une forme de contrôle parlementaire qui passe essentiellement donc par les organes euh, parlementaires, mais aussi par la mise en place d'un auditeur général. Et ma la question est de demander, euh, est-ce qu'éventuellement l'adoption de cette loi sur soi aux dispositions euh, nationales, euh, notamment donc par rapport à Madagascar, en ce qui concerne le processus d'évaluation de, des, des politiques publiques Ou est-ce que cela peut être euh, complémentaire et par rapport à la nomination du, de l'auditeur général, il est mentionné euh, au point 36 que cette personne est nommée par une commission indépendante. Et ma question, c'est comment est constituée cette commission indépendante Quels sont les membres de la commission Quel est le, leur mandat euh, de manière à assurer véritablement l'indépendance. Comme, comme l'a mentionné mon collègue, euh, à Madagascar, nous faisons face à, à beaucoup de euh, modifications budgétaires en fonction de, du contexte, notamment des aides pour la COVID, des aides pour les catastrophes naturelles. Et il est important, effectivement, de pouvoir exercer un contrôle parlementaire 
euh, crédible et indépendant. C'était ma question. Je vous remercie pour la proposition de loi et je remercie le présentateur qui a été excellent. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, Greenberg, yes. Daniel. Yes. Do you, do you um, want me to respond to those points yes, now? Yes, we, we have many hands, so please uh, be brief in your response so that we can take as many. Uh, but can you confirm to me that uh, the interpretation to English uh, for Madagascar was, was done? Because I, I, didn't, I didn't get it from my... Yes, I heard, I, I heard, I heard an English heard interpretation. It. Oh, okay, that's all right. Briefly, so that we can take more hands. Go ahead. I, I will do my best to be brief, but th those are technical um, comments of some complexity. So I will, I will, I will try to combine brevity and accuracy. Um, in relation to the comments made by the uh, the distinguished delegate from Mauritius, first um, on the question of witnesses, I, I. I don't disagree with that point at all. And I would be very happy to expand the range of witnesses, but I remind us that of course, Parliament has very different approach and powers in relation to the interrogation of private commercial witnesses compared to when there is a public official before Parliament. Um, in particular, I remind us that uh, in relation to a commercial contract of the kind that the representative suggest, uh, mentioned, you would have to consider uh, laws of self-incrimination, you'd have to consider laws of privilege, you'd have to consider laws of legal professional privilege. It, it, I, I have absolutely no objection to widening the, the pool of witnesses, but there are issues that the parliamentary committees would have to consider for themselves, as usual, when dealing with non-public uh, non officials before them. Um, so if the Honourable Delegate would do us the kindness of sending in that response with any details of the class of witness he would like to see included and any conditions in relation to that, we will definitely give it fullest consideration. Um, on clause 113 and whether it's limited to conviction only, well, as presently crafted, it is not. My own view is that the answer to the question about separation of powers is that this is not a problem of separation of powers. And the reason is that the only sanction available under clause 113 is disqualification for public offices of a specified kind by resolution of parliament. Those are, not, those are not penal sanctions of a kind that a court, in accordance with separation of powers, would impose. Those are offices that are under the control of parliament, and it is for parliament to determine whether an official is proper or improper to fill that role. So I believe that there is not an issue of separation of powers, but again, I am enormously grateful for the perceptive and penetrating challenge, and I would encourage the delegate, if he is able and willing to do so, to put it in his written submission, and again, I will consider it as carefully as it clearly deserves. In response to the first dele delegate from Madagascar, I accept the point completely that we have to operate a differential approach for different jurisdictions. The Honourable keynote speaker, the Honourable Brian Dubé, alluded to that in his own opening remarks. And in a number of places, that is reflected in the model law in ways that I have shown this morning. If the Honourable Delegate believes that there are aspects of the model law that require further express flexibility for that purpose, perhaps he will be kind enough again to put that in, in, in writing uh, to us, and I will ensure that attention is given to it. Um, he mentioned in particular, sorry, I, 
I beg your pardon, by the way. I'm, I, I believe that the, the delegate was male, but I may be confusing this with the voice of the interpreter. So I hope honourable delegates will forgive me if I refer to somebody by the wrong gender, um, because I was hearing the interpreter's voice and not their voice. The first delegate from Madagascar also alluded in particular to, um, to emergencies and disasters of a cyclonic or other nature, and those are referred to in a number of places expressly in the model law. Again, if the delegate feels they should be expressly referred to in other places, please let us know in your written submissions. Time limits the same. There is flexibility for different timing limits under the model law, and the same principle applies. In relation to the questions of the second delegate from Madagascar, um, the, the um, yes, I agree, there will need to be national provisions supporting the provisions of this uh, model law in relation to the evaluation process of public policies in jurisdictions that don't already have them. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, we've had to strike a balance between knowingly overlapping in some cases and not overlapping in cases where we think that would be inappropriate. But in domesticating this law, that balance will have to be adjusted according to each national circumstance. And finally, in relation to the appointment of the Attorney General under Clause 36 and how will the Independent Commission be established, as I say there in uh, drafting footnote 22 to Clause 36.2, uh, some jurisdictions already have an appropriate public service commission under their constitution or otherwise, and I would expect um, in those cases that commission to be used. Other jurisdictions that do not have an appropriate mechanism will have to establish one. If the honorable uh, delegate from Madagascar feels that we should make some provision about the establishment of an independent commission, again, if she will favor us with some thoughts about the essential components of that additional provision in writing, we will certainly give very full attention to the challenging and important uh, issues that it raises. Those are my responses to the, to the points made so far. Thank you, Professor, um, for those uh, remarks. Uh, can we now move on to Namibia? Uh, followed by uh, Botswana at the same time. I think Dita Pelo should be Botswana. So Namibia first, then Botswana. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Greenbank. Thank you also other honorable members and the Secretary General. My first uh, point that I would like to raise is on the appointment of the Auditor General whereby it is stated here in the model law that the appointment is to be done by a commission. Now, the reason that I'm raising is the fact that in Namibia, it is a constitutional provision that after parliament has recommended the candidate, this person has to be appointed by the president. So uh, I, my question is whether we should keep to that instead of a commission or whether it has to be changed uh, to establish a commission to do the appointment. The second point is a point that has been clarified by Mr. Greenberg also, and that was the fact that uh, ministers to make uh, regulations. That in itself would not give independence to the Auditor General in the sense that uh, we the, the, the regulations are not coming into the House for discussion. It is regulations that they are making there. And we have got a very bad experience of such things already in Namibia itself. So I think it is good that it has been sorted out. The third point that I would like to raise is on the Public Accounts Committee itself, whereby it is stated that Public Accounts Committee has to be chaired by the opposition, which is very good. But in some jurisdictions, like for instance ours, there is no clarity whether the deputy chair would also be from the opposition and, or whether it would come 
from the ruling party. Thirdly, there was an issue that was mentioned on the PAC that PAC should not be dominated by the ruling party. What is it exactly that you are meaning with PAC not to be dominated by the, the ruling party? Because in essence, the ruling party's backbenchers are more in parliaments. And we would like to know what this is meaning. I thank you very much. Thank you. Very uh, short and sharp questions. Um, uh, Botswana? Uh, thank you very much. Um, my, my first point is on the, the need to, to have mechanisms for buy-in of the, the model laws uh, by, by, by SADC PF, um, the, the buy-in of member states, um, particularly executives uh, in our countries. Um, I don't know if they can be a way to bring this to the attention of governments um, at, at SADC summit, or alternatively, our economic higher command at the Ministry of Finance. Um, because by and large in many SADC jurisdiction, jurisdictions, in um, Botswana is no exception. Legislation is seen by and large as a prerogative of the executive. In other words, bills are brought by ministers of government in parliament. And it's very rare, very, very, very rare for a private member's bill to pass. Um, we have made attempts, some of us, to take some aspects of the model laws of SADC PF and present them as bills in parliament, as a private member's bills, and they've been rejected. So I, I, I'm just worried that um, uh, we, we may need to, to find a way uh, to get these um, brilliant ideas to the attention of executives, um, either as I've said in the Ministry of Finance or heads of state and government at a SADC summit. Um, that's my first contribution. This, the second one is um, I've not been able to, to read through the, the, the model law. Um, and, and I was just wondering, in our, in our jurisdiction in Botswana, we have special funds. And I, I don't know if this is the case with other countries. We have special funds like your, your alcohol levy, um, in which every time you buy alcohol, there's a levy that, that's, that's collected into a special fund with an, um, a clear objective of sort of mitigating the adverse effects of alcohol in the society. And, and then we have many such, such levies like the National Petroleum Fund, uh, the tobacco levy, the roads levy. So these special funds, I, I was just wondering if the model law, if there's any aspect of the model law which speaks to the special funds. I'm particularly worried about this aspect because these are substantial amounts of money. Um, and in, in our country, it runs into billions. And the, the law as it is, allows the minister to authorize the use of uh, monies from special funds for a purpose other than which, that which is stated in the, in the fund order. All the special funds have, the special, uh, have fund orders. And these fund orders will regulate how the fund should be used. But um, the, the provision permitting ministers to, to authorize the use of funds uh, for a purpose other than that which is stated in the funds without clear parliamentary authorization or resolution, it presents an accountability problem. And the reason I, I, I say this is because these are substantial amounts of money. So, and I was wondering if the modern law speaks to, uh, speaks to that. On the last point raised by my, my brother from Namibia, um, in terms of domination of the ruling party, um, it, 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 it has been a problem. It has been a problem in, 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 in some countries where uh, sometimes you find that the ruling party will make majority of uh, members of the public accounts committee. Uh, in our case, it's 50-50. 
uh, five members from the opposition, five members from the ruling party. And um, it's always chaired by the by the opposition. I'm the chair, I'm the current chair. But but I know in the past, there have been this problem of uh, uh, imbalances. I, I guess it's because uh, also in, in our parliament, there's, there's, there's been that challenge of uh, the, the executive dominating parliament. Our executive, I think it's about close to 45% of, of parliament. Uh, 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 45% or so members of parliament of Botswana are members of the executive. Um, and they also represent more than 60% of the, uh, the ruling party caucus. So this presents a challenge um, when it comes to, uh, to, 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 to committees. Um, I think let me stop here for now, I think. Uh, thank you, honorable member from, from Botswana. Uh, your first question will be, I would rather have the secretary general uh, respond to your first question rather than a uh, green map. Um, if the SG is here, uh, please prepare to respond to that question. Or if she's not, uh, whoever is next senior to, to respond to, to that question. But before we can go to the responses, let's have Sebastian and Ruth. And you can put your hand down, uh, honorable member from Botswana. Thank you, sorry. Sebastian, which country are you? Uh, I'm from the Seychelles. Seychelles, please. Yeah. Do I have the floor? Yes, uh, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the SADEC PF for organizing this, uh, this very fruitful uh, meeting, which has allowed me to, to touch base and see uh, what is happening within the SADEC PF. Um, as you may be aware, um, the Seychelles, in relation to the Corruption Perception Index, we, we were able to make substantial improvement this year. And I think we are ranked first in Africa. And in relation to the Auditor General, our Auditor General has been ranked as one of the most independent. And this has come from one very important perspective, and that was political will, which can cost in the long term. So I would like that, first of all, for the presenter, to weigh in on, in the preparation of this model of law, have you considered how to entice or, 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 or stimulate political will to ensure that the changes which you are proposing through this model of law is accepted by the executive? We had a former president who wanted to embrace these ideas, but in the long term, it would expose uh, issues within the government, which eventually would cost um, political parties, the, 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 the leadership of their countries. So that's one question. The second issue which I would like to bring to your attention is that you've made several comments within the, within the presentation which you, are, which you have made, and I wonder whether you've had the opportunity to consider the law from the Seychelles. Uh, am I still, still on? Yes, please. Go okay. ahead. Yes. And in relation to the law from the Seychelles, a lot of the, of the issues which you're discussing, we... We encapsulated in the act which we which we brought about in 2012, but there, there will be we are we are anticipating that there will be changes to the act. One of the things which I which I would like to propose you include is that we are now in a position whereby when it comes to the national budget, we we process everything in relation to grants, loans, donor funding through the through, through the budget, through the appropriation in the budget. So the National Assembly has direct access to knowledge of what grants is going through the system. There is no, no outside or, or, or special purpose vehicle that is used in relation to grant because that has to be part of the, fi financial, of the financial policy process, which the minister has to present under our current law to the National Assembly. We, however, have a problem with the current government which, was, which has started introducing the concept of special purpose vehicles which my brother from Botswana was alluding to, whereby you have funding, extra budget funding, which can be used by government through policies. And in that respect, I disagree with Mr. Greenberg in that policies should only be enshrined in relation to subsidiary legislations that are tabled in parliament. So that parliament can decide whether the executive power, which we have given to with the legislative power, which we have lent to the executive, it is actually using it for the purpose that it intends to use it. Um, my final point is in relation to the constitution. 
in the Seychelles, our powers emanate from the supreme law of the land. So as the current chair of the PAC, I can call in any witness. I can supersede any law because I, I, my, my powers are enshrined in the constitution. I have the same powers as the Supreme Court in compelling the attendance of witnesses when it comes to any particular case or issue, which can be under investigation. And in our case, I can I react to the report of the Auditor General. I can initiate investigations, but I can also, uh, also um, through, through uh, resolution of parliament, uh, act on issues that have been brought to our attention by members of the public. And we hold all our sessions in public. So the issue that I would like to, to, to point out within the model law which you're proposing, there has to be a balance or there has to be a consideration given to how you, you reinforce what you want to propose to achieve through the model law by enshrining this and encapsulating it in the supreme law of the land. If you do not do that, and I've heard several members mention this, even the member from Mauritius, you run the risk of creating a situation whereby you would want to investigate an issue, but some witnesses will be out of your reach. And just to give you a quick example, um, we had an investigation in the past through the PAC, whereby we compelled um, the uh, director generals of the current of, of private banks here. And they, they argue that under the Financial Institutions Act, there are some information which they, are, which they cannot give in relation to confidentiality. We recognize the, uh, the, the importance of confidentiality, but the constitution states that in relation to um, an investigation or any issue being investigated by a committee of parliament, parliament has the power to compel the attendance of any witness. So I wanted to, to see whether um, when it comes to the model law, there can be additional input made in relation to strengthening how the law proposes to go about ensuring that parliament can exercise its oversight and scrutiny role. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sir Charles. A very interesting uh, contribution um, and a very interesting case that you, you presented to us about the, uh, the powers of, of the chairperson of the park. Very interesting indeed. Uh, but before uh, there's um, a response again, um, or rather, I have Ruth. Um, Ruth, please. Uh, Ruth, you are from which country? Ruth. Angola. 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 I am told uh, it has come to my attention that uh, there is in South Angola. South Angola. Hello. Uh, just a minute. Uh, it has been brought to my attention that there is no interpretation in French. Uh, can the ICT people look at that? Uh, go ahead. Uh, a that, that's legal. Thank you, Mr. Senhor. Obrigado. Eu estou a ouvir a minha voz. Está a minha voz 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 está Muito obrigada por me conceder a palavra. Okay. Eu queria também juntar a minha voz àqueles as, os colegas que felicitaram o Fórum uh, Parlamentar da SADEC uh, por organizar este evento, que eu considero de extrema importância para podermos abordar as questões uh, relacionadas com o, o orçamento as questões relacionadas com os orçamentos. Eu, antes de mais, eu gostaria, por aquilo que eu tive a ler e pela apresentação, apesar de ter sido muito, muito rápida, mas há aqui uma questão que eu gostaria de apresentar e tem, tem a ver até com a, a, aquela posição que o senhor Daniel Greenberg apresentou inicialmente, como nota inicial, 
da, da, do cidadão que vivia na aldeia e que reclamou porque, de facto, as grandes obras, as grandes estradas que eram construídas estavam nos centros urbanos, mas lá na aldeia não havia nada. E nós, o que eu gostaria aqui de frisar é que os nossos orçamentos pecam precisamente por isso. A questão está no orçamento programa, a questão está na função parlamento, na planeamento em relação ao orçamento. Nós continuamos a fazer o orçamento como há, há, há 50 anos atrás, como há quase 100 anos atrás, porque de facto não temos em conta a, a planificação, a importância do plano para o orçamento. Me parece que essa é uma questão que nós devemos abordar eh, 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 com detalhe na, nessa, aqui na, na, na proposta de, da Lei Modelo. A, a, a outra questão eh, é aquela que tem a ver com o, a participação das, das nossas populações na elaboração do orçamento. Nós, de facto, fazemos orçamentos muito bonitos, mas os orçamentos são feitos a partir da, das centrais, das, das cidades capitais e, e, e das sedes provinciais. Lá na aldeia, onde estão os problemas, nas comunas, onde estão os problemas, nós não estamos a prestar ainda a atenção devida. Eu também gostaria de ver a lei modelo com, com alguma ênfase, abordar essa questão com alguma ênfase. A outra questão que, 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 que eu também não vi aqui e que gostaria também de ver, porque é uma questão que cada vez mais eh, nós necessitamos que as, as discrepâncias que existem a nível de género sejam, eh, eh, sejam evitadas, é a, a elaboração do orçamento na ótica de género. Me parece que é, é importante nós abordarmos essa questão aqui, os nossos países começam, de facto, a dar alguns passos, mas eles ainda são tímidos. Então, me parece que a, a lei modelo uh, devia abordar também essa questão com alguma ênfase. É verdade que a decisão final é dos países, mas se ela tiver na lei modelo, é sempre uma baliza e, e sempre ajuda a, 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 a que nas nossas realidades uh, possamos uh, enveredar para, para este caminho. Essas são algumas questões que eu gostaria de apresentar aqui como contribuição e, mais uma vez, uh, 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 felicitar o, a, o, o Fórum Parlamentar da SADEC e felicitar o, 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 o excelentíssimo senhor Daniel Greenberg pela, pelo trabalho profundo que uh, está a ser feito e que acabou por nos apresentar aqui. Muito obrigada. Thank you, Angola. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I see some hands, but um, allow me, Dr. Charles, allow me to uh, get back to you after uh, some responses from Greenback. I think he has had a, a lot of questions already. So we will come back to you. Um, but for now, we will rather have uh, Greenback responding. Greenberg, there are two questions that you may choose to respond to or you may not because they are political in nature. Uh, uh, one from the Honorable Member from Botswana and the other one from the Honorable Member from Seychelles, which uh, both speak to the issues of political will. Um, uh, I thought those questions would be better responded to by the Secretary General. But if you feel you you want to say something uh, uh, around them you can but you are not compelled to uh, please go ahead uh, thank you um, thank you the honorable facilitator i had already come to that same conclusion myself in respect of those two questions and i'm grateful to your for your support in that respect um, the honorable delegate from namibia asked about clause 36.2 and whether uh, different approaches could be taken in particular jurisdictions to the appointment of the commission. And I very much agree that that is likely to be the case. And indeed, as I have already adverted to footnote 32, 
makes the point that it will be necessary to contextualize according to each jurisdiction. Um, the honorable delegate from Namibia also drew attention to the question of the composition of the Public Accounts Committee and asked in particular um, in relation to clause 44.5b, how does one avoid um, domination by the governing party in a parliamentary committee? And um, I say two things to the Honourable Member for Namibia. The first is that this is one of the reasons why the model law does have to be subject to the processes and procedures of each individual parliament, because different parliaments have different approaches to the rule about majority standing within different select committees. The parliament with which I am most familiar, the Parliament of the United Kingdom, there are some select committees that must have a government majority, there are some select committees that must not have a government majority, and there are others that may or may not, depending on the circumstances. So the model law must respect the parliamentary traditions of each, um, of each jurisdiction. However, I would say to the honorable delegate from Namibia that the, the aim articulated in clause 44.5b does not refer to a majority, it talks about domination. And I would say to him that that is, a, that is, a, that is a, a concept which is not necessarily the same as majority composition. And it may be that even in a jurisdiction that has a majority of members, of government members on the PAC, it may be that there are parliamentary mechanisms to prevent that majority from stifling the expression of the minority opposition members. I merely invite him to consider whether there are representations he could make in writing that would enable me to sharpen up that clause with a specific view to enacting the principle that he has described in the jurisdictional circumstances that he has described. Uh, I, I, I think, if I may say so to him, I think this is a particularly important point in the effective functioning of the PAC. And if he were able and willing to provide some further uh, advice in writing, I would find it particularly valuable to consider whether we can nod at it more effectively. I pass now to the comments of the Honourable Delegate from Botswana, um, and I do accept the Honourable Facilitator's um, invitation not to address the question of political buy-in, which is not for me to um, address. Um, I, I will permit myself the following quasi-technical observation. In my view, a bill of this kind is not appropriate for a private member's bill. And I say that not as a political observation, but as a technical observation. I do not know of any jurisdiction in which the public bill, the, public mem the private member's bill procedure is designed to accommodate bills of this complexity, sensitivity, and technicality. Subject to that, I make no comment about the engagement of, of political will. Special funds were asked about. Uh, yes, I agree. They are already adverted to in clause 54.3b, but we could advert to them in other places. They, are, they do have a subversion potential. We talk about special accounts in clauses 28 and 29. Um, hypothecation through a special account is always difficult, as honourable members know better than I do. But yes, I could say more about them. And if the honourable delegate from Botswana would be kind enough to submit some more details of what they believe the special fund provisions should, should be addressing, I will be very delighted to look at that. I come now to the comments from the honourable delegate from Seychelles, and I again uh, accept the invitation of, of the uh, Honourable Facilitator not to respond to the first question. Um, uh, I, um, I would say that 
I have to make sure that this bill is transparent and clear in what it does. I have to make sure that the provisions of the model law are clear. Um, it is not for me to provide in the text of the model law the necessary political will, and the, the Honourable Secretary General, I'm sure, will have uh, observations to offer about that. Um, the Honourable Delegate from the Seychelles mentioned the, um, the um, importance of including grants and sources of all kinds in the budget. I believe that is already provided for expressly in the model law. Uh, he mentioned SPVs in particular, which again are, are covered in a number of ways. I would encourage him to, again, if he were able and willing to uh, suggest in writing any specific detail about how SPVs and special funds should be addressed, then as with the Honourable Delegate from Botswana, I would be particularly delighted to see those and to think about them. The Honourable Member from Seychelles uh, said he disagreed with me about policies and said only if tabled in Parliament. Um, I think he must have uh, missed in uh, uh, he must have missed my express reference in my presentation to the the uh, laying before Parliament and the tabling Parliament in clause 133b. I do not understand the, therefore the nature of his disagreement with me and he will have I fear to be kind enough to set it out in writing and then I will of course look at it and do whatever is necessary to accommodate him. Um, he also said that the POC should have power to compel any witnesses. I've responded to that point um, in response to the uh, Honourable Delegate from Mauritius and uh, said I would be definitely happy to include that and as I said to him um, we will, however, need to think about the special circumstances that appertain when you have a non-public official before you, and that will be something that the Honourable Delegate from Seychelles is already very familiar with, um, and he mentioned his particular constitutional position under the Seychelles Constitution. Um, so again, I agree with that subject, the caveat I made before. In response to the Honourable Delegate from Angola, um, I believe that some of the issues to which she adverted in particular um, are already addressed by the model law, in particular by requiring a transparency and sustainability and equality and diversity statement to accompany the budget. I would invite her to look at um, Clause 62 on equality and diversity and consider how far that takes us along the path that she was outlining in relation to gender balance in particular. And if she were able and willing, having looked at Clause 62, to suggest strengthenings and modifications of that, if she were able to suggest in writing some specific aspects that we should make clearer and stronger, I would be enormously grateful for that, and I shall look forward to aiming to address her comments. I hope that deals with the comments that were made. Uh, thank you, uh, Brenda. Um, where is Dr. Charles? Dr. Charles, you had your hand up for a very long time. It's your time. <laughs> Um, the two questions on political will uh, will be stood over until the end of the session, where we will request our Honorable SG to make a closing remark and at the same time uh, respond to those broad uh, questions. But for now... Uh, thank, you. Um, thank you very much, oh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much, and I'm sorry which, that I'm Which going... country, by the way? Which country? I'm from Tanzania, Tanzania, United Republic of Tanzania. Thank you. Um, and, uh, Tanzania I'm a member, is the floor. I'm a member of the parliament and um, a member of the budget committee, as well as the, the committee dealing with the trade and industry. Um, 
I, I joined late, unfortunately, and um, I did not. Um, I was not privileged to, to 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 see the presentation which was made, but I wanted to make a few remarks because I know I, I, I have gone through them in terms of reference, uh, and the remarks also are based on, on on what I have heard my colleagues talk about. Uh, first and above all is the, the question of um, uh, the question of of um, regulation, regulation uh, the, the, the whole question of the model, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the model, model law. I, I was thinking that this is, um, it's, going, it's supposed to be tailored to each country, uh, and that's what I think is going to happen. It becomes like a framework for, 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 for tailoring a, um, a, 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 a law, the, the law that will govern financial management in each country, but then uh, with the specific um, uh, with specific um, articles um, which suit the country, because for example, there are many things which I, I see um, in the context that in Tanzania in Tanzania we are we, we are we are quite open and the PAC is very powerful. It can call it can summon um, anybody from any uh, from any public body to 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 act to to answer and to, and to, to explain. Uh, things that happen um, in terms of financial mismanagement. So I, I, don't, I, I do not think that it's um, something which is going to be very difficult for, for Tanzania to adopt, but I think uh, it, it, it will really require to, to look at some things. That, for example, I saw, I saw in, the, in, the, in the terms, uh, the gaps that were mentioned uh, about the targets on, um, on, on public debt. Mm -hmm. um, the target on public debt, it, it, I don't think is very realistic. It should, be it should be a target on maybe budget deficit to GDP, something like that. But if you, if you look at public debt, it depends on specific country circumstances and what resources the country has. For example, if a country is rich in minerals and is rich in natural resources, uh, the public debt may be a little bit uh, accommodated. And uh, there is no reason why we have, um, People are talking of 50 percent, 60 percent of of GDP as the as the target for for public debt. I think that is a little bit different to, to in each country the the, the, the sustainable fiscal um, deficit and sustainable uh, public debt is it depends on on specific country circumstances. So we cannot uh, uh, have a, a common target um, for, for all countries. And I think uh, there are many countries that have more than 60 percent, but they. they when they are assessed, um, objectively, they are found to be um, sustainable uh, in terms of debt and in terms of the pu public um, uh, uh, government deficit, budget deficit. But again, I, I was, I, I, I am curious about the performance based, performance based budgets, for example, I, I, and I will request the 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 the, the, the resource. Uh, person there to, to, to help us to give me an example of what type of um, of KPIs can you set on, on, on the government um, uh, in terms of um, uh, financial, uh, is financial management um, uh, objectives. Uh, I have um, a problem with supplementary budgets. Supplementary budgets, I, I, in my view, supplementary budgets must be approved Prior to the end of the year, it, they, they should be approved probably uh, by the, 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 the by the, the, the second half of the fiscal the fiscal year. Because if you approve budget, the supplementary budget retrospectively after the budget cycle is, is over, then the budget the the, 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 the parliament will not have much um, uh, control over what happens in in, in terms of how much. Um, the deficit would be uh, if the government allowed, for example, to 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 to, to consume and then later on to, to report it and, and then they, 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 they to get a parliamentary approval of what has already ha happened. Um, I I I the issue of, of opposition uh, and um, the PAC composition, uh, public Ac Ac accounts committee compositions. In, in some countries, for example, in, 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 our, in, in our case, uh, the opposition is, is very small. It, it, it 
can become very, very my, a big minority, and that doesn't meet the the the, the, the concept of official position. They are minority, but they, they, they are very few in the, the parliament. So you cannot actually, under those circumstances, say that um, necessarily the, the, the PAC will be chaired by the opposition because well, there are no people. And of course, when you are looking for a chair, you must look for a capable, uh, for a capable um, personality. But also, again, um, I think this, this is a very special circumstance. It happens in many countries, it can happen in some, in some cases where you do not have the um, acceptable members of opposition to chair and or, or to dominate the PAC. But there's nothing much on the on the budget committee. Um, I think the budget committee also has a lot of of say in terms of transparency of the budgets, in terms of the, of, of meeting commitments that uh, international commitments. Um, in, because definitely the, the 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 budget committees are very uh, proactive in terms of budget preparation. And um, in, in this case, I think there must be a way to ensure that um, we give more responsibility in the in, in the, the model law uh, to the budget committee so that they can uh, um, that they can ensure that these international commitments and regional commitments can be um, achieved. But this is the same also in terms of the. Uh, I, I, I do not think that. Um, uh, putting limits on quantum of contracts on, 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 on um, the, the, the executive can enter enter into is, is very reasonable because uh, you may paralyze things. But I think uh, to the extent that this, these are audited properly by the Auditor General and the, the Public Accounts Committee have, have, have the role to, to look at these contracts once they have been um, entered into I, I don't think we should limit and, and say that okay they should await a, a, a parliament to to, to to approve or to, 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 to I think this 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 this, this will, will, will cause a problem to the executive, but it, it depends really on whether the the, the the threshold you are talking about. I think the, the proposal here, which I saw here, was a three percent um, limit. Uh, that, uh, if it's more than three percent of GDP, then it must go to the parliament. I, I don't think. There are so so much big contracts that they will enter into anyway. It, 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 it should be a lot of money, but I don't think that there will be so many. But for example, we have the, the standard gauge railway. The, the contract, of course, could be in the, of that magnitude, up to about 3% of GDP. But again, um, it, it, they, they are approved by the parliament retro, retrospectively uh, after the, the executive have entered into such contract. If they are brought to the parliament, the parliament will definitely give a go ahead because there, there, there will be motivation um, about, about it. So this is what I wanted to, 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 to submit, but I, I, I'm very sorry that I did not um, go through the, the presentation. And uh, so I, 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 may be, I may be talking something which may not have been um, said by the presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you, Tanzania. Uh, we will respond. Um, for now, uh, let us have Malawi. Honorable Gladys from Malawi. Uh, thank you so much, moderator, for recognizing me. Uh, I'm um, I've got one issue. I've listened to the presentation. But what I've noted, as my colleague, honorable colleague from Tanzania has indicated, is uh, there is total blackout with regard to budget and finance committee of parliament in the model, uh, study uh, model law of um, public finance management. And that will create a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, I'll give an example. In, in, in Malawi, we, have a, 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 uh, we are reviewing our PFMA as we speak. And we've made proposals on the areas that we want to see um, amended in the PF, uh, uh, Public Finance Management uh, Act. Uh, one of the areas that we've uh, proposed to be included in the uh, new, uh, the amended one, is that uh, we should have uh, mid-year reports. Because as we speak, we don't have, we know, of course, we normally have mid-year uh, budget session, but it's totally up to the minister to decide whether to have it or not. It's not mandatory for, for an honorable minister to have a, a mid-year 
um, you know, budget review. So we've included that uh, in the in the uh, Public Finance Management uh, Act that is being uh, reviewed. And also, um, there is an issue of public expenditure tracking. As my department and from the budget itself, we are not doing much in terms of public expenditure tracking. And yet that's one of the mandates of the Budget and Finance Committee of Parliament. So we've clearly indicated the roles of the Budget and Finance Committee in the new uh, public finance management that is being that, that is being done. And again, our mandate as the Budget and Finance Committee of Parliament, we are supposed to be engaged in the in the whole monitoring uh, of the uh, budget implementation the implementation process, but that is not done. So it's got a lot of gaps that 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 that, that are there in the current uh, public finance management act, and we are taking the opportunity to make sure that now budget and finance committee comes clearly in the new act, so that our role should be clearly defined in the new in the in the new act. Now, if now that is missing in the Masadic model um, law, then we'll, we'll have problems because it means we're going backward. We'll not be able to influence anything. They'll come back to say, no, in the model, Masadic model uh, law, there isn't anything to do with the budget. And yet there's everything to do with the budget because there's a difference between public accounts committee and uh, budget and finance committee. Public, in my public accounts committee, you are dealing with the auditor's report. It's public accounts committee and you're doing public, public accounts, uh, I mean, uh, auditor general's report. Whilst the budget is, 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 is doing online checking, it's doing implementation checking, it's, it's providing checks and balances whenever the budget is being uh, implemented. So if we're going to leave budget and finance out of the whole thing, then we, we are going to have um, a problem. Now, someone talked about the numbers in the, uh, in, in the public accounts committee and also budget and finance committee. In Malawi, it's chaired by an opposition member parliament. And as I said earlier on, I'm, I'm the chairperson of the, uh, of the budget. The challenge that is there is that for political parties, it's their leadership that do appoint members into those committees. So the leadership will decide who to vote to into those committees. That is fine when it comes to political parties. But when it comes to those that are independent, it's the speaker herself determining who should be in the budget. And what has transpired is that the speaker, whoever the, uh, the speaker is, chooses people, independent members of parliament, that are sitting in the, on, the, on the government side and not on the opposition side. As I speak, we are twenty members of there are twenty members of budget and finance committee in parliament here. I mean, yeah, on the parliament here, but just five of them are from the opposition. The rest are from the ruling party because the speaker has got powers to appoint membership in the budget and finance committee. That is an irregularity, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if you leave if we leave everything into the hands of the um of the, the jurisdiction itself and not forcing other countries to do certain things that are right, that are good for the for transparency and accountability purposes. I can assure you we are not going to move forward. But there are some countries where but you need, we need to apply force from static level. And such countries, one such country is Malawi. There is need to, 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 have to come, up with, uh, come up with that model law, which is very commendable, but also enforce it from the, from, from the static level. Because if we just leave everything to, to Malawi parliament, then nothing will change because it is highly politicized. And everything else goes with numbers. Whether it's a good policy or a bad policy, as long as government says let's approve it, we're going to approve it. As long as the opposition says, even if the opposition says we should not approve it, government will still approve it because they have numbers, regardless of what the people are saying, regardless of what the actors are saying. So there is need also to look at individual countries and see how best those countries can be can be assisted. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Malawi. Thank you, Honorable Gladys. Uh, I really appreciate and uh, uh, really uh, accept uh, the, 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 the concern that uh, you are raising, I am, and I'm sure um, our drafter will, will engage, engage you. Um, let's take the last one before we go to the, to the responses. Honorable Freddy, uh, which country are you? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moyo. Uh, I'm coming from Zambia. Uh, I'm okay. the chairperson for the planning and budgeting committee. Uh, and I just to thank Greenberg for his presentation. And I think my major uh, concern is just on part eight uh, of the whole document, which is under the, the government borrowing. Uh, generically, I see where uh, I think the minister has been given too much powers throughout the document, 
Uh, and this, I think, is a concern which has already been raised by some of the members, somehow indirectly, when it comes to the issues of borrowing. Um, I say so because you find, uh, even in the same document, when you come to the issues of, like, the, for example, the debt ceiling, where you are proposing to put it about 60% or so, if that goes, and when the current document has it is, you may find a situation which is happening anyway in most of the countries now. By the time you realize that maybe your debt ceiling is above 60, 70, 80 percent to that of GDP, and then you, you, when you look at the whole, the, the, the whole, the whole issue, you you find that it's because the ministers are being given uh, too much power. Uh, by the time these documents come to Parliament, uh, I'm sorry to you that term, you find it's like just Parliament does rubber stamping. So I wanted to see in a way, in a document that which guides uh, maybe step by step. For example, uh, uh, say before any borrowing is done, can that come to parliament for approval as number one? Obviously, we still have those challenges of where you find maybe if you are in the ruling party uh, and usually they have the majority numbers, so you find technically uh, approvals are given. And also the, the issue of like supplementary budgets, can we see this coming for approval to parliament? before the actual uh, spending is done. Uh, so that was my point. I, I feel in part eight, uh, if I thought there was a way of maybe restricting this, I'll, I'll give an example like in Zambia, where we have been uh, working on uh, a document like the Loans and the Guarantees Authorization Act, which, uh, by, by, uh, which has, in fact, been on the table for a very, very long time, uh, where we thought before uh, uh, contract any kind of debt, this debt must be approved by parliament uh, 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 as opposed to where by the minister will just come on the floor of the house and then he give you the, the figures of the current uh, debt situation. Uh, so I just wanted to come in and just to, to say if there was a way of really looking at the uh, part eight under the government borrowing, where you try to give more teeth to to parliament, either through committees, uh, I submit. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Honorable Fred from Zambia. Thanks for the submission. Uh, for now, uh, let's have responses from our legal man, Greenberg. Thank you, Honorable Facilitator. Um, in response to the comments made by Dr. Charles Kime, the, the Honourable Delegate from Tanzania. Uh, yes, I agree, it's a framework for each country, and I said that in a number of places. Yes, it requires to be contextualised, and the footnotes in the document draw attention to specific contextualization issues. Um, I would encourage the Honourable Delegate, as I have said to others, um, if he would be kind enough to Right with any specific areas where he thinks contextualization raises difficulties. And indeed, the Honorable Delegate from, um, from Malawi drew attention to some of the difficulties of contextualization in some areas. If you would be kind enough to, to send any specific areas where he thinks contextualization can be further supported in the text, I will be very grateful to him and will certainly give attention to that. Um, if I may say to him, the, the Honourable Delegate from Tanzania, if I may say to him on the question of the debt target, um, that is something that's very difficult because the model law needs to jump in one direction or another. And it is difficult to, this is one of perhaps the most difficult places to combine certainty and flexibility with the ability for different jurisdictions to contextualize without completely undermining the safeguards and protections in the model law. I therefore um, will be specifically inviting the technical working group to reconsider the debt target in the light of his observations and other observations that honorable delegates to this and other consultative forums um, may provide. And in that context, in, in, in that spirit, if he has any particular, um, particular um, evidence or, or um, um, support for a view that we should change the target in a specific way, perhaps he will be kind enough to, um, 
provide that through to the consideration to be given by the technical working group. Same on performance-based budgets and supplementary budgets. Um, we have not provided, a, as he says, we have not provided a backstop for the end of the year for supplementary budgets. I would certainly be happy to consider that. Um, if we do do that, of course, then we have to consider what do you do for budget variations after the end of year. But of course, we can take that into account if you would be kind enough again to, to indicate how he prefers that particular point to be dealt with. Um, and um, I, I also, if I may say to the Honourable Delegate from Tanzania, I completely take his point about the um, need for specific flexibility on the composition of the Public Accounts Committee, and in particular his point about the strength of the opposition in any particular jurisdiction, and indeed at particular times, because these things ebb and flow, don't they? You know, sometimes the position can change in a jurisdiction. Um, I repeat what I said in my response um, to the um, to the honourable delegate from um, from the to the honourable delegate from uh, Botswana. Um, no, excuse me, from Namibia. I repeat what I said to the honourable delegate from Namibia that yes, we do need to avoid domination. And there are perhaps different ways of avoiding domination. And um, if I may say to the honorable delegates from Namibia and um, from Tanzania, their different contributions on the question of the composition of the PAC it focus brilliantly the difficulty of getting the model law balance right, because they are, if you like, two extremes of the, of, of the situation. So I will look forward to reading both of their observations and seeing if we can strengthen that point um, so as to provide something that works for everybody. And that brings me to my observations in response to the comments of the Honourable Delegate from Malawi. And all I really want to say is I completely agree that we have to get a balance between allowing people to contextualise, which we must do, and not allowing people to contextualise contextualize the model law out of all possible purpose and effect. And I think that, I, I think the Honourable Madam Secretary General, when she addresses the political will points um, shortly, may have some observations on how we, um, how we incentivize effective domestication, allowing contextualization without allowing what I would call dilution of the principle. And if I may say to the Honourable Delegate from Malawi, I heard her comments very clear on that. Um, and to the extent that we can uh, nod in that direction helpfully, then we certainly will in accordance with the directions of um, Madam Secretary General. Finally, in response to the Honourable Delegate from Zambia, um, yes, I, again, I take the point about ministerial powers under Part 8, but can I turn back the question to him and indeed to other honourable delegates and say one of the things that we are clearly going to have to struggle with in revising the model law is a lot of different people want some of the ministerial powers um, diluted or, 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 or modified. Fine, we can do that. But answer me this. Who then makes the detailed regulations? <laughs> there has to be detailed subordinate implementing legislation. We cannot have um, an effective model law without implementing regulations. Who is to make them? My first answer in the, uh, obviously this is not a question for now, this is a question inviting further um, discussion as we go through the consultative forums and further written submissions. But my answer in the model law is, there are things where the executive has to make the regulations, but parliament has to approve them and control them and scrutinize them. That was my opening shot. That has not entirely found favor with all delegates in all respects. So, okay, let's hear, what, what, let's hear your views for alternative mechanisms that allow proper, flexible implementation while retaining parliamentary control. And if Madam Secretary General, who I know is about to speak, if she would just permit me one more observation before she does. 
It may be that what we have to do is tighten up the specific parliamentary control mechanism, approval mechanism of those regulations that are particularly sensitive because they relate to the issues that the honorable delegate from Zambia mentioned or other, other issues to be mentioned by other delegates. That is something that we will have to take away and think about. Um, I again, thank all honorable delegates for their perceptive challenges. Uh, thank you, Greenberg. Uh, the, the honorable member from Malawi, um, I thought she raised the specific question. She felt that the budget commit, the budget commit is uh, is. invisible its document if i got here right uh, she felt that she the the document our draft is is muted on on the issues pertaining specifically to the budget uh, commit uh, do you think you you responded to that and did i get you right honorable member from malawi yes you did okay Sir, Sir Greenberg. Um, to the extent that I failed to respond adequately to the point of the Honourable Delegate from Malawi, I wonder if she would be good enough. I, I, I have to say I did have slight difficulties at some point in, in the, the sound quality. Um, I wonder if she would be good enough to adumbrate her concerns on that particular point in writing, and I will definitely take it into account. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You I'll much. do that. Uh, honorable members. Thank you very much. Okay. Honorable members, we are now drawing towards the end of the meeting. Um, um, before I call upon, before I invite the Secretary General, I still have some five minutes. If there is anybody uh, with um, a follow-up question, follow-up intervention, or a new contribution. I, we don't want to close out any idea. We need all ideas. So uh, this is your time. Uh, if you have got anything, uh, Honorable Brian Dube, then Honorable um, Member from Botswana, in that yeah. order. Thank you very much, Doc. I just wanted to give a, a response to what Prof. Greenberg indicated relating to the issues of interpretation by the courts and how we must model our laws so that there are no contradictions in terms of the intentions of us as parliamentarians in the SADC region and what then the court to interpret our laws to mean. I, I, I'm sure he made that in his presentation to say in terms of the perspective on interpretation, how do we model our law to make sure that it is it achieves what we want because we, we have also the judges to interpret that particular law. And my response will be quickly as follows. He, Literally, we need to make sure that our, our model law is as simplistic as possible with the general meanings clear and not subject to misinterpretation in terms of the literal rule of interpretation. Uh, and I believe that the model law that I have perused, which Prof Greenberg did, by and large, he achieves this by making sure that the proper definition of terms in terms of what we intend them to mean. And also it is very simplistic for everyone to understand. It's not complicated in terms of the jargon, which is very, very important in terms of how we need to model our laws. Because our main challenge comes with interpretation, especially if we come up with very complicated laws. And also uh, my view would be that uh, a 
after the laws have been put in place, it may also be very important to, to then also have symposiums with the, the judges and chief justices the, by the SADAC parliamentary the, the forum to make sure that maybe the mischief or the intentions of SADAC in terms of coming up with this particular model are uh, actually made clear and we, 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 we get to understand and appreciate the efforts of the, the SADAC forum in this purpose because the mischief of the law is what is more important. Was you note that not all the countries who adopt uh, or domesticate this model law, but obviously as soon as it becomes uh, a model law in the region, the courts may start to use it here and there in applying the domestic laws, as always happens in the case of Zimbabwe. Our High Court and the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court always borrows from these regional instruments and regional acts. So it, may, it becomes very important to make sure that the mischief or the intention or the desires of SADAC in terms of coming up with this law are made very clear so that we do not have illogical and insensible judgments coming in terms of how this law is applied and interpreted. That's all I wanted to say, Honorable Mo. But personally, I'm impressed with the language and sequence of the model presentation because it makes the whole law very simplistic, which is actually the smartest thing to do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Honorable Duve. We are very excited to, to hear those words. I mean, the compliments are very important whenever they are due. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable uh, Ditapelo Lefec Lefoco, uh, my apology. That's your time. Uh, okay, thank you. Floor. Yeah, um, the, on the earlier point which I made um, regarding um, a, a political will, um, the, the response was that there's a complex law which um, would, it would be more easier if it, it has to buy in on, of, of government, I would assume, and be brought by a minister of government, um, in particular, minister of finance. Um, I, 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 I want to believe that's what... Uh, um, uh, 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 Daniel sought to to say, um, but what my 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 observation is that with uh, regard to all the other SADC PF model laws, uh, two of which I participated in in, um, in in discussing and ultimately adopting as a substantive member of of SADC PF, then uh, I'm no longer a member now. Um, was that the, the model laws, when you, 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 you compare them with what we have uh, in Botswana, for instance, um, they, they are not necessarily, if you, if you, if you look carefully at them, uh, requiring an overhaul of our systems or our laws, but to augment, to augment. That is why uh, my comment on, on, on a private members bill uh, was sort of against that backdrop, that when you read through the model law and you look at the laws in a country like Botswana, um, the, the, the model law serves a purpose of improving what's already in existence. That is why uh, in that context, my view was that even a private bill can suffice uh, insofar as implementation of the model law is concerned. Uh, it may be different in a country where there's a, a need for a complete overhaul. But in our case, I don't think that is, the, that is the case. Whether it's model law on elections, whether it's model law on HIV and AIDS, whether it's a model law on a prevention of child marriages and protection of children already in marriage. Um, this require uh, just to augment what is already in existence because uh, some of us are far ahead in terms of uh, uh, some of these things. Um, I, I thought I should make that point clear. Um, and, and, and I think my question remains um, again uh, in terms of what needs to be done to, uh, to get the buy-in of uh, executives. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Honorable Member from Botswana. 
um, your question, uh, we heard it last time. Uh, we heard you very well. And, but thank you for enhancing it. It will be responded to uh, by the Secretary General. Um, I see more hands now, but briefly, um, let's have Tanzania. Thank you, Bruno. I guess what uh, my question is, is, is a small one. How do we submit uh, our written comments? Oh, well, Mr. Okay. Uh, thank How you very much. Okay, the, thank you very much. I think the SG is also listening. She will respond uh, to to that. Uh, Honorable um, Gladys from Malawi. Yeah, thank you once again. Um, I wanted to find out uh, through you, moderator, if we have a study um, uh, committee or rather caucus for the chairpersons of budget and finance or even planning uh, so that whenever we push our recommendations to have the budget issues included in the model law uh, should, should, should be something that is applicable in, in most countries. Because we may, I may push in something that is only you know, applicable in Malawi and not the other countries because as the honorable member from Botswana has indicated that they are very far ahead and they may not need, need such an inclusion. So it's better we have a, a small focus on, on, um, on these issues and it should be for the budget uh, chairpersons or the finance chairpersons together and agree on what exactly we're talking about and what should be included in the, in the, in the model law. And the second one was, was, was the issue that the honorable member from Tanzania has asked. I wanted to ask to check how, we, how are we going to submit the written comments? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did I get you well, Honorable Member from Malawi, uh, uh, Honorable Ganda? Are you yes. proposing a consultative meeting uh, mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, the chairpersons of uh, the budget committees in the region, similar to yes. what we have yes. today? You are, are you proposing that? Okay, yes, uh, we'll be able yes. to respond. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can put your hands down now. Both of you, honorable members, uh, your hands down. Uh, Malawi and Botswana. If your hands are up, I'll, uh, I will assume you still wanted to, you still want to say something. So you can put your hand down. Thank you. Um, can I go to Greenback? Is there a specific question that was directed you and your 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 closing word, your closing remark, your closing. Greenberg. Uh, no, honourable facilitator. I believe I have responded to all the questions put to me. I'm enormously grateful to everybody for their observations, and I will look forward to reading any written submissions. And we will definitely do our best to revise the model law to reflect the uh, expressions uh, the, the, the made today for which we're enormously grateful. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. It is our tradition in Africa here to clap hands for somebody who has done well. I, I'm sure members are clapping hands wherever they are uh, uh, for, for you, uh, for the sterling work. Um, now, what it remains for me to do um, is to invite our esteemed, uh, distinguished uh, Secretary General uh, to respond to some of the questions, clarify some of the issues that were raised and also give, give us a pack after lunch, but um, I felt that you have made your contributions. There is, I, I think unless there is a, a very strong disagreement, but uh, uh, looking at the contributions, I think we have come to that time where we can have our Honorable Secretary General uh, Poema Sengoma. Please, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, um, Honorable um, Dr. Moyo. And um, honorable members, allow me to address you are seated um, at this point. Um, it is not out of disrespect, it's just the convenience of, of where I am right now. Um, wow, this really has been um, an interesting session, um, which I, I truly appreciate. Um, I, I appreciated the issues of the concept of political will, which we all know are quite complex and play out differently in most of our countries, because a lot of times one needs to look at the motivation and the intent um, for them to come up with an indicator of the lack of political will or political will that is in, in each country. Um, honorable members, allow me just to also say that polit political will can be tackled. We need to look at avenues of consistent advocacy. We need to also look at the fact that the model law has already indicated, and as you have already testified, is a robust advocacy tool in itself. And as Rampas puts it, a model law is actually a model, no more and no less. So as a SADC parliamentary forum, we look at this as a model or a gold standard. And we don't intend that at the national level, there should be similar, there should be any contradiction in this respect. So at the end of the day, once this has been adopted by our organs, we realize and recognize that some countries may have reservations because they believe they're ahead. Some countries will look forward to the model laws um, informing their countries as a benchmark because when we develop model laws, we don't actually have a specific country in mind. We come up with a model law because it's a template and this template could be used in, in numerous jurisdictions across SADC. I believe that answers the issue for Tanzania and many other countries. It is also true, honorable members, that we need to think of political will throughout because domestication struggles will not change in a day. Hence the model law is to act as a catalyst to accelerate understanding and harmonization of norms. If this model law is adopted by the 51st plenary assembly session of the forum, we believe that it will still depend on national legislative action. So we leave it up to you as honorable members to assist in making sure that the domestication process evolves according to the requirements and complexities of your national realities. It will differ from state to state that we acknowledge. And that is what uh, Dr. Greenberg has been emphasizing throughout his presentation. Where we sit at the SADC Parliamentary Forum, we believe that we can only look at capacity development sessions where members of parliament can lobby through public normative frameworks such as this one. We believe that member parliaments could also lobby the executive at national level to ensure that they borrow from the best gold standard or the model that they have put together. We have admitted that the provisions of the model law will not take on board every scenario, will not tackle every country's unique situation, but we must underline or appreciate the fact that this should be seen as a gold standard where possible to allow us to benchmark against it. So with the necessary parliamentary um, volution, the model law provisions that are contained in this draft will progressively trickle down and find their way into domestic law through your lobby, through your advocacy, through your capacity, capacitation processes at national level for other members to appreciate that this was never meant to contradict or usurp the powers that you hold as lawmakers in your own jurisdiction. 
but it was meant to be serve as a benchmark or as a tool that you can use and that can improve your systems or create the gold standard that is found elsewhere for us to be able to borrow from and improve the SADC region. In closing, honorable members, this consultative process today has demonstrated to me, and I believe my colleagues, the beauty and brilliance of parliamentary deliberations, which is everything that the forum wants to promote. Diversion views are essential so that the model law is robustly tested in view of finding its way to a smooth adoption process once tabled to the 51st plenary assembly session. Parliamentary logic takes care of the view that people themselves will take control and enhance the quality of the deliberations that you have today and ultimately the, the, the adoption of the model law. And it is imperative to hear your views on this model law. We believe you'll go back and consult the people. There is a consultation that is planned for civil society organizations, which we believe that will also add value to this process. Allow me to thank you honorable members. Let me thank Dr. Daniel Greenbeck and um, don't ever feel you're taking too much time. This is where we gain insight into the thinking that went into the model law and also to respond adequately to some of the issues that are tabled. We've done quite well and thank you for always um, stepping in and giving us um, a lot of insight in this process. Let me thank Honorable Gordon Moyo for always being available despite his busy schedule and for always offering his skill and knowledge in processes where he has experience and technical know-how. And let me allow the technical working group, thank them for always being present and assisting us in this process. We have an onerous task ahead. We have to receive written submissions from yourselves, honorable members. Kindly email us at pfm at sadecpf.org. pfm at sadecpf.org. Your submissions will be considered. They'll be weighted. We'll look at what can be taken on board. What we're unable to do so, we'll explain at the time of validation, or we need to come back and explain that this has not been successful for the following reasons, or we may need to look at another tool to take on board some of the suggestions. I took note of the request from Malawi on putting together um, you know, committees, uh, budget, committees focusing on budget. I will consult internally and look at the resources that we have to see if that is feasible. However, we do invite you to also still make written submissions from your respective countries for us to consider. The calendar has been drawn up and um, quite congested, I wish we had shared it with you, but we will endeavor to make sure that we can respond to some of your um, requests where possible. I thank you honorable members and um, I wish you a good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Madam uh, thank, SG. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. We have, we have come to the end of our of our session, of our meeting, of our program. Uh, God be well. We can now close the meeting. Thank you.